Okay, Your Worship, we are live. Uh, thank you, Mr. Larmer. Again, I'd like to welcome everyone to the Committee of the Whole session of Monday, August 24th. Previous to this, we held a closed session of council. And if you look at your agenda, we're now at part three, agenda addition. And I'll be moving to the Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Your Worship. There are three uh, agenda additions uh, this afternoon. The first is a correspondent from Valda Corporation regarding a request for an extension to Council Resolution 463-19 on the deferral of an applicable building permit, planning application, tree and parkland fees, and levies for the subject development at 311-325 University Avenue, Coburg, Ontario, and 387 William Street, Coburg, Ontario. Second is a memo from the Deputy Director of Community Services and the Recreation Coordinator regarding the Coburg Community Center reopening plans. And the third is a memo from the Secretary of the Parks and Recreation Advisory Committee regarding a recommendation regarding the Coburg Beach. The action recommended that the matters be added to the agenda. Are there any further discussion on the agenda additions? Councillor Beatty? Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, through you to the Deputy Mayor, and my comments just really more for a sequence. Um, the addition to the Parks and Rec, uh, the Parks and Rec Advisory Committee um, recommended action. I'm just wondering, it's currently published on the agenda as item number five, whereas the memo to the status of Victoria Beach is listed as number two. I'm just wondering if we could bump up the Parks and Rec Advisory Committee recommended action to follow our conversation on the memo for the status of Victoria Beach, uh, just in an effort to discuss these related subject matters in sequence. Uh, Mr. Larmer, I know that's permissible. I need a simple majority for that to happen, I believe. Is there any further discussion on the point put forward by Councillor Beatty? See no discussion, all those in favor? Carried, so noted. Any other point of discussion? All those in favor? Carried. Are there any disclosure pecuniary interest members of council on any of the items tonight on our agenda? Seeing none, we can proceed, Mr. Larmer. Next, Your Worship, members of Council, we have a presentation um, from Oscar Poloni, the Office of Managing Partner at KPMG, regarding an update status report on the Town of Coburg Service Delivery Review. And Oscar has joined us in taking the screen, Your Worship. Hey, thank you. Well, Mr. Larmer, if I may, can you just confirm that you can see the title page of the presentation? Yep, yeah, looks good, Oscar. Well, good afternoon, Your Worship and members of Council. Um, thank you very much for allowing us the opportunity to be here today to provide Council with an interim update with respect to the service sustainability review that's underway for the Town of Coburg. Joining me today virtually is Lori Huber, who's the partner from Kingston, who's assisting us with the review. And for the purposes of today's presentation, there's really a couple of things that we'd like to talk about. We'd like to bring Council up to date on the work that's been undertaken to date over the course of the summer, just to give you some sense as to where we are in the process, what's been done, and what's left to come. We'd also like to talk about some of our initial findings. And I will, I will caution Council that these are preliminary in nature, and as our work progresses, some of these messages may change. They'll be refined by additional analysis, but we're starting to see messages that are starting to emerge through the process that we wanted to share with council and then talk about the next steps and allow council the opportunity to ask any questions that they have as we're sort of midway through the process. So as council may recall, may recall from the initial presentation that we had, there's basically six main work elements that are included in the service review. The first one is the development of an inventory of municipal services to talk about what the town does, why you do it, the level of resources, and other factors relating to your services. And to date, there's been a total of 33 service profiles that have been developed. 
encompassing a range of different services. And just for the information of council, we've provided a listing of the services and the service pro profiles that we have in place. In certain instances, such as public works, what you'll find is there's services that have been split into different components. In other places like finance, for example, there's one profile that covers the gambit of the service. There's also other services that are out of scope for which we haven't provided any profiles, but the reason why we lift, list them here, your worship and council is because we have basically accounted for 100% of the municipality's budget. We have reviewed every dollar value that you spend. Um, and as Mr. Larmer and, and the CAO can attest to, we've actually reconciled down to the dollar. So that is the service profile development. And just as an example, we've talked about what some of the service profiles will look like at the beginning. This is an example of what one looks like for libraries that talks about the overview, the public policy objective that you're seeking to achieve, why you deliver it and some performance measures as well. And once again, council, I just wanna reiterate, we're still in the process of working through these with your staff, so they will change as the work progresses, but we are um, deep into the service profile. Process mapping is the second component, and this is breaking down the town's functions, specifically to get some sense as to how you deliver work and are there any efficiencies that can be achieved by looking at technology, eliminating duplication, how would you enhance customer service, for example. These process mapping sessions are going to be scheduled within the next two weeks. So we anticipate that we will be on the ground working with your teams to go through these. There is a comparative analysis that we've prepared that involves seven municipalities that we are building into the service profiles when we look at the comparative analysis. We had proposed a number and then there were two that were suggested from council during the initial presentation that we have added as well. Um, we are undertaking a resident survey to get their perspective on the municipality and the services you deliver. As of last week, when we had prepared this presentation, there were a total of 122 responses that have been received. The survey is going to continue to be live um, into September. And so because of that, we will be updating our analysis as we move forward. As our work progresses and as we move through the profiles, the comparative analysis and the process mapping, there are opportunities that are starting to come up in our mind anyways, as to things that the town could look to in order to change your operations, save costs, improve efficiencies and enhance customer service. These are being identified by KPMG and in September, we expect that we will be validating these to make sure that what we believe is an opportunity actually reflects an opportunity because what we want to make sure of council is that we're not putting things in final reports that aren't practical, that aren't viable and frankly don't make sense, which is why there's a validation process that's planned for September. And then our final report, we anticipate reporting in October, 2020. And we will work with Mr. Larmer to um, organize that to meet with your existing schedule for council meetings. One of the things that we had discussed was the issue of the new CAO for the town. And our recommendation to the town, and it's recommendation that we directed towards staff, and it's something that we would suggest from council's perspective, is we believe there is a lot of value in having a conversation with your new CAO before we finalize this report. And there's a couple of reasons for that council that we believe this is the case. One is the new CAO may bring perspective on municipal operations and opportunities that we may not have thought of or that your staff may not have thought of. So it's a good opportunity for us to capture um, his or her mindset and where they want to go with the municipality and where they think there may be opportunities that we haven't considered. The second thing and equally important is it's a good opportunity for us to socialize our opportunities and our analysis with the CAO to get some sense as to the extent of fit, to see if there's any concerns that she or he may raise with respect to the opportunities from an implementation perspective, from a governance perspective, from a community and employee impact perspective that we believe needs to happen and be reflected in the final report. So what we have requested and what we've agreed with with the town, 
was we would extend the reporting from September to October to allow us to have that conversation with the town's newly appointed CAO. Um, our understanding is it still provides sufficient time for the municipality to incorporate the opportunities into your budget process. It also fits within the timeframes that the province has established for the modernization fund. And so we believe it makes a lot of sense and it's a good thing to do this. And so because of that, that is what we've suggested from a timing perspective. With respect to the community survey, and as I've mentioned, we're doing a survey to get the perspective of the town residents. There's nine questions that we've asked. Three questions relate to respondent information. So the age, the time in the community and the income. And the reason why we request this information Council is that when we look to the responses, we will specifically look at um, specific populations inside the community. So for example, those that are seniors, those that may have lower levels of income, that type of stuff, just to see if that there's specific messages and specific themes related to those groups that may not necessarily be reflected in the overall results. We do ask questions concerning town services, so the frequency of use, the perception of importance, and the perception of service levels. We do want to talk about communications effectiveness, because oftentimes what people will talk about is how transparent are municipalities and how good of a job do you do, not only in communicating what the municipality does, but why you do it. So there's a series relating to communications, we want to get some perspective on some broader community issues such as affordability, quality of life, and the like. And then lastly, we've left open an open session, an open section for comments where people are able to provide specific comments that weren't necessarily been captured in the more formal structured questions that we've had in advance. As I've mentioned, as of August 18th, there's been 122 responses that have been received to date. 84% are from residents that are over the age of 40. And of that 84%, half or 40% in total of the responses are um, people that are over the age of 65. And so what we're going to do once again is we want to take a look at how that demographic responds to see if there's specific concerns from a senior's perspective. The majority of respondents, almost two, um, 90%, are what we consider to be um, longer term residents of Coburg. So 62% have been in place more than 10 years and 31% more than 20 years. What we can see is that 26% of respondents reported incomes between 75 to 100,000 and 38% have income over $100,000. So when you look at the survey, roughly two thirds once again have income over 75 and above. There's a component that's below that for the information of um, mayor and council, according to Statistics Canada, your average income is somewhere in the range of 80 to $90,000 per household. So we wanted to get some sense as to how people potentially below that level may view municipal services and what their perspectives are. So just a little bit of background and insight council as to what we've done and where we are from a survey perspective. In concern, in respect to the initial findings, and once again, um, I'd like to reiterate that these are initial findings, and as our work continues, these may change. But from our interviews that we've had with each member of council, I can appreciate it's been some time ago, but our perspective is, is around the council table, from a general standpoint, there is very little to no interest on the part of council with respect to the reduction of municipal services. It's very clear to us, Council, that um, the members of Council clearly recognize the importance that the town plays in meeting the needs of the residents. There is a priority focus that's been expressed to us with respect to operating efficiencies and customer service enhancements. And what this really comes down to, I believe, is a desire on the part of Council to make sure that you demonstrate value for money that you use public funds in an effective and efficient manner, and that you make sure that there's stewardship in place, make sure that municipal funds are being used appropriately. And the concept of 
little to no interest or limited involvement with respect to municipal service reductions really does somewhat fit into the degree of latitude that council actually has. So what we've shown on this slide council is a summary of your operating expenses and your municipal levy by type of service broken down as to why you deliver it. And what you can see is that roughly 66% of your municipal services are either classified as mandatory in that there is a legislative requirement for you to deliver them and the municipality has no choice and you can't outright eliminate them or they're traditional in nature um, where 25% relates to services that you would expect a municipality of your size to actually deliver. In terms of true discretionary spending, those services that there is no requirement to deliver from a legislative standpoint, they're not considered to be essential services, they're not traditionally delivered by other municipalities, this is less than 10% of what the municipality actually spends. So nine cents on the dollar is what we would consider to be discretionary services. What you'll notice is from a municipal levy perspective that the percentages actually change. So the bulk of your levy requirement is either mandatory or essential or traditional services. What you'll find is that your discretionary services, the truly discretionary services, account for one to 2% of your municipal levy. So the concept council of coming in and looking at wholesale service level reductions and cost reductions, which really isn't a message that we've heard from council, to be honest, wouldn't necessarily be sustainable based on the nature of your services and what you spend. Now, just because a service is mandatory, just because a service is essential or traditional, doesn't mean you can't change how you deliver it. And in certain cases, doesn't mean you can't change the service level. But from an outright service cut perspective, you really don't have a lot of latitude. And if I could be frank, council, a lot of municipalities don't. So we've also done work with respect to taxation level. And, and one of the questions that council may recall us discussing during the interviews, and it's a valid question, is related to the level of taxation and specifically affordability. And the question that we have is, do we believe that taxes are high in Coburg or do we think that your taxes are fair or lower than your comparator peer group? And what I do want to caution council is the analysis that you're about to see tells you the what, it doesn't tell you the why. And as council is aware, there are a number of factors that go into tax and tax levels. Um, to the extent that some of the services, for example, are fixed in terms of the cost of delivery, in terms of there being differences in service level, in terms of there being differences in income level, these are all factors that will influence affordability. So it's important to recognize that the analysis really is limited just by presenting how you fare. You have to dwell into the reasons why. And so in order to demonstrate how we look at affordability, we prepare this graph and along this axis is the residential taxation per household, lower versus higher. And along this axis is the average household income, lower versus higher. And admittedly council, it may be a bit of an oversimplification, but from our perspective, municipalities that have higher levels of income can have higher levels of municipal taxes without having an affordability issue. Those municipalities that have lower levels of income, if they have lower levels of taxes, they forego some of that affordability concern. So really what it is, is the balance. And you can see from the comparison, the average is the dotted line. And what you will note is that Coburg is above that line. And so what you will find is that proportionately speaking, in comparison to the average level, average level of household income, taxes in Coburg represent a greater percentage of household income than in places like Tilsonburg, Brighton, Essex, Strathroy, Caradoc. And so what you'll find once again is you're towards the north of that municipal average, which means there's a higher percentage of income that's being paid towards municipal taxes in Coburg than everywhere else. What I do want to caution council 
And just to give you some perspective, on the low end of the range, it's 3.2%. On the upper end of the range, it's 4.5%. So we're not talking about wholesale wide differences between these, but the reality is, is your taxes in comparison to your income, in comparison to the peer group, are high. When we look into the factors that contribute to that, when we ask ourselves the question why, what we can see is two messages. When you look at what we consider to be core municipal services, those services that are mandatory or essential to be delivered, what the comparative analysis is demonstrating is that your costs are actually faring well in comparison to your selected peers. So in order to give you an example of this, and, and we tried to simplify it because it is an interim presentation, the blue, dark blue bar is the levy requirement in thousands that the town of Coburg has for a variety of different services. The light gray bar is the town of Essex. And we picked the town of Essex because it's got a similar number of households and similar population levels to you. And what you can see is that for services that we, admittedly, this is our term council, and it's a classification term. It doesn't, it's not intended to reflect on the importance of any municipal services. So I want to make that very clear. But for those core services, those mandatory services, the things that are essential, what you can see is that when it comes to these, and it's basically from recreation programming and facility all the way down, your spending is generally in line with, or in certain cases, lower than your peer municipalities. In the case of this case, Essex. And the analysis is consistent across the board. So what that means is, is when you look at services and service levels, it's not necessarily being driven by those core functions, if you will. And indeed, Council, what we find is specifically with respect to IT and specifically with respect to clerk services, what it actually appears is that you're under investment, where you're spending less than your peer group. What we have noted, Council, and once again, this isn't to comment on the importance of services, but what you can see is that there's a heavier investment with respect to economic and tourism development, and also with respect to arts, culture, and special events programs. And I'm not saying these aren't valid programs, and I'm not saying they're not important to the community, and I'm not saying that you shouldn't be presenting them or delivering them, but what you need to recognize is that if your investment in these is higher than other communities, you will see it with respect to the tax rates because those services have to be paid for. So what this gets down to is the fact that in certain cases, the municipality may place more importance on these types of discretionary programs, such as ec and tourism development, arts, culture, and special events. And so because of that, it's reflected in your taxes. So once again, a bit of a discussion about the what or and the why. What we also find, your worship in council, is certain municipal services actually have a limited effect on the municipal levy, where they're discretionary in nature and you're spending them, but what you'll find is that the non-taxation revenue is actually sufficient to offset those costs. So if you recall from the earlier grant or earlier slide, we talked about how discretionary programs account for roughly 9% of your spend, but 1% to 2% of your levy your marina and your campground are discretionary programs. What you'll find is that your marina is budgeted to pay for itself through non-taxation. The campground is actually budgeted to make money for the municipality. And so because of this, from a outside looking in perspective, we could say that, yeah, the marina is a non-traditional service. It's purely discretionary if you wanted to you can eliminate it and we can appreciate council through our own interviews that there is a considerable sensitivity in the municipality with respect to the marina and expansion plans and what have you. But what you can see is that from a financial perspective, eliminating programs like the marina and the campground, to be honest with you, aren't going to save you any money. There's other reasons why you would do that. And once again, this is operating not capital. But at the end of the day, these are not large draws on the municipal levy as they currently stand that we would suggest represent an opportunity that from a fiscal perspective, 
there's a business case to look at. With respect to the Coburg Community Center, we've also heard that there's sensitivity with respect to the cost and there's sensitivity with respect to the recovery percentage and what's on the levy. Um, what you will find is that the operating costs of the CCC, they're not inconsequential. And the reality is, Council, if I could, if I could make this comment at the expense of gross oversimplification, there are municipalities that wish they had a recreational complex like you have with respect to multi-use um, and that type of stuff. But you need to recognize that, and I know you do, these services and these facilities cost money. What you can see though, is that from a non-taxation revenue perspective, you actually recover more than half of the cost of the Coburg Community Center. So from a cost recovery perspective, your non-taxation recovery is actually pretty decent in comparison to some of the peer groups. And, and I will confess counsel that as I get older, my position is softened, but one of the things that I have consistently believed in is that recreational facilities should not pay for themselves exclusively through user fees. Because if they do, only those that are wealthy will actually use them. And you lose the very valid public policy benefit that you have of having a tax subsidy for it. Now, could you tweak it? Absolutely, but at the end of the day, one of the things that we will comment on is while there are pockets of discretionary spend throughout your budget, in certain cases, they don't translate into a levy impact. I mentioned the survey and once again, we're still in process of delivery and collecting the results. But one of the questions that we're particularly interested in and one of the things that we wanted to highlight for council today is the view of your community on service levels. And we basically asked three questions. Do you believe that service levels are too low, which is in blue? Do you believe that service levels are appropriate, which is in light yellow? And do you believe that service levels are too high, which is in red? And what you can see, Council, is there's varying degrees of responsiveness and various perspectives on municipal services, depending on the nature of the service. Um, what you will find is that in certain cases, there is a high degree of agreement within the survey respondents that the municipality is delivering at the right level. What you will find in certain cases, there's areas where they're actually looking for reinvestment. And it is not uncommon to hear people say, we need more money for roads, we need more money for recreation. What's interesting, and once again, is we are going to be running this based on the demographic profile. So once again, lower income versus higher income, older residents versus younger residents, because what that will allow us to do is to be able to discern the extent to which people view specific recreational and other infrastructure differently based on the age. So how do fe seniors feel about the senior center versus the general population? And that isn't intended to be honest counsel to be able to game the system because we're not looking to come to a predetermined outcome. I just know from our discussions with council, the concept of this is specific to seniors or this is specific to lower income. How does that population respond? I know somebody is gonna ask us that question. So I wanna be able to answer it, which is why we designed this survey the way we did. So a bit of insight council with respect to the uh, interim results. And once again, everything's subject to change. In terms of where we're going, we do need to finalize the service profiles. I will apologize, Council. I needed to reschedule a couple of meetings because I needed to help my mom with some medical issues. So we're waiting to reschedule some of those. So that's on us. Um, we will be completing the process mapping to look to those efficiencies, internal control improvements, customer service enhancements. We will be reviewing the draft report, both with staff and the CAO just to be able to validate, to be able to confirm, to be able to say, is there anything else that we haven't thought of that you would like to share with us? Recognizing council that there may be some instances where we are going to disagree with your staff as to a course of action. When that happens, we leave it in the report and we'll just note it as part of our final report. And then we will be down, we will report to council on the final report and answer any questions that council may have. My hope, 
your worship in council is that that last meeting will actually be in person. We have indicated um, to your staff that we want the process mapping sessions to be in person. We also want to have the working meeting with your staff and the CAO in person as well. Digital and remote is nice, but in certain instances, I think you actually need to be in the room with people. So our intention is to start to be present in Coburg for some of these elements. And hopefully council will get the chance at final to meet face to face. So your worship, members of council, that concludes our presentation. I'd like to thank you once again for allowing us the opportunity to be here. If there are any questions that you have, we'd be more than happy to answer them at this time. Hey, Oscar, as before, I uh, thank you for a most informed presentation. It's appreciated. And I saw Councillor Burrell's hand up. Thank you. And thank you for the work that you're doing. Um, my question is, is the survey so far only had 122 people. So how are we going to um, engage our citizens in order to get the survey by the most amount that we could possibly do? Through you, Mr. Mayor, I, I, will, I will caution Councillor that that was August 18th, so there may have been an uptick in survey counts by then. Um, that said, I don't know the numbers because I didn't check today, to be honest. What I would suggest, um, Council, is what we have done in the past is towards the end of the month, beginning of September, what we would like to do is we'd like to sit down with your staff and we'd like to sit down with your communications department to talk about the statistical validity of the responses that we're getting. Because the issue is there's 20,000 people that live in Coburg. There's upwards of 9,000 households. If we end up with 122 people responding to the survey, what I would suggest is that's a little skinny. So the answer to your question, Councillor, is we do propose to meet with your staff end of August, beginning of September, and talk about additional ways to promote this. In certain instances, what you can do is you can actually pay to have increased distribution and increased profile for your surveys. I'm not sure that's actually something that you want to do, but we could have conversations with your staff. I do know you have a communications function. What I would suggest is let's run the survey for another week, see where we are, and then have that conversation. Okay, thank you. And uh, Oscar, just for your information, uh, recently in this past year, uh, Cobra Council supported uh, the program called Bang the Table. Uh, when we put that out in different avenues for responses, traditionally with a reasonable time period, we're averaging, I would say, close between 1,300 and 2,000 responses. So when you have that conversation with our communications department, perhaps that could be an asset that we could offer that may assist you in uh, your gathering of information, but just uh, for FYI. Thank Are there you. other questions from members of council for clarification? Councillor Chorley. Thank you, Mr. Poloni. I really appreciate the update. Just going back to slide number eight, I was wondering if you could help me understand the difference between traditional services and essential services. I think I have a good understanding of mandatory and discretionary, but I just was wondering if you could give us a few examples of those different kinds of services. Through you, Your Worship. So the definition of an essential service is a service that does not have a legislative or regulatory requirement to deliver but which we believe is essential either for the effective operation of the municipality or the preservation of property and public health. So let me give you a couple of examples. Under the Municipal Act, there's two mandatory positions inside a municipality. There's a requirement for a treasurer and there is a requirement for a clerk. There is no requirement for municipalities to establish the position of CAO. And so because of that, and, and with respect to the CAOs, um, that is not a mandatory function. What it is, is it's an essential function because it is required to be able to operate the municipality. What I will say as well, Council, is there is no legislative requirement for municipalities to deliver water and wastewater services. And I have municipal clients that have neither. 
What I do is though, I will classify water and wastewater services as essential services because clean water is an essential requirement for public health. Fire pressures are essential requirements to ensure that you can actually fight a fire. And similarly, wastewater is the same approach. So what you will find is that is classified as an essential service. A traditional service is something that isn't mandatory. It's something that isn't essential. And I'm not, and I'm not trying to be flippant when I say this, but nobody will die if you don't have this service. But what it is, is it is a service that is traditionally delivered by municipalities of your size. And included in this bucket are things like parks and recreation, arenas, aquatic programs, trails, playgrounds. What's also included in this are things like cultural programming, heritage programming, those types of services that aren't bucketed under mandatory or essential but are traditionally delivered by municipalities of your size. Now, I will say, I have a client that has 288 people. The concept of investing in things like heritage programming and um, cultural programming and art galleries or the like, whatever, at the end of the day, they don't do that because they're too small. But let's be honest, you have more than 288 people. A municipality of your size, you would expect this type of a delivery into it. Where you find the discretionary bucket is very, very specific to certain programs. So for example, your municipality makes an investment in affordable housing. That is not a traditional service because if I could be frank council, that's an upper tier responsibility. The fact that you have chosen to do it is irrelevant. That's a priority that council has developed and if you wish to continue it, that's fine. What we're finding though, is that's not traditional for lower tiers. What I will say council is 10 years from now, that may actually change because what we're finding is more lower tiers are getting into affordable housing programs. The other discretionary service that you have is the, the criminal background check activity that operates inside your police service which you typically would not see inside a police service to that scale. So these are very point specific services that we could point to, to say, we don't really see a lot of other people doing this. And it's interesting, I talked about affordable housing. There's a physician recruitment program that the town undertakes. That is considered to be a traditional service because organizations your size and even smaller deliver physician recruitment. So that's, Councillor Chorley, the distinction between them. Um, unless your municipality has gone completely in a different direction than other municipalities your size, that traditional bucket is very, very small. So I hope that helps provide the explanation. Uh, Councillor Chorley, does that provide clarification before I move to Councillor Beattie? It does. That was very helpful. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor Beatty. Thank you, Your Worship. And Oscar, again, thank you for this extensive detail. Um, please don't take my question as definitely not challenging our expertise. I was just listening to when you were talking about discretionary programs and absolutely affordable housing is at the regional tiered government, Northumberland County. Um, I just want to, and I believe we talked about this in our conversation, um, yes, our municipality and other municipalities lower tier in Ontario are getting into uh, a supportive role in affordable housing, whether that's through community investment program or other creative initiatives. Uh, I guess what I'm getting at is, will the service review take into consideration though, when you have the county, so the regional government coming to the member municipalities and their councils, asking them to co-align and to support their regional strategies, is that taken into consideration in the service review? And so when does something like that become discretionary and then kind of be, turn into a new era service as we, as a member municipality works to co-align and support the county's requests? Through you, Your Worship, and, and Councillor Beatty, that's a good question. What you'll notice in the service profiles is we talk about the basis for delivery and to the extent that the county comes to you and says, hey, can you kick in that will actually be reflected in the survey profile and so it will give it and and once again council i want to make this 
I want to make this very clear. Um, just because something is discretionary doesn't mean it's a candidate for cut. What I would say is it's actually the opposite. The fact that you've gone off of a traditional model from a service perspective means that you've done it intentionally. And so because of that, around the council table, there's been the, the resolution at some point that says this is a valid program that we want to deliver. I agree with you, Councillor Beatty. It's important to be able to reflect all of the reasons why you do that. And to the extent that we haven't come up with it, your staff have been very good to point us in the right direction. And I can appreciate there's the play between the county and the municipality. We will endeavor to make sure that we reflect it appropriately. And does that satisfy your uh, question, uh, Councillor Beatty? Okay, other, other questions for Oscar? See, oh, Councillor Charlie. I just have one last question. Um, we do have a delegation that's registered and they're, I believe having read their material, they are raising some questions about the, um, the resident survey. How important is the resident survey in your analysis? I believe the citizens were just questioning whether it was granular enough regarding the different services and types of services we provide along the waterfront. Um, through your, your worship, if I may, the, the concept of KPMG administering a resident survey actually wasn't in our scope. Um, it was something that we have added to the review as part of a value add. Um, I, am, I am cognizant of the fact that there is a delegation made and, and regardless of the position, I think the concept that people care enough about the community that they're prepared to come to council um, to, to share their points is a good thing. And I'm not trying to be facetious here. What I will say about the survey is a couple of things. One is this, from our perspective and based on the terms of reference, is primarily a financial exercise. What we will be doing is identifying opportunities for consideration that will consider both financial and non-financial implications from the opportunities. The reason why we took the survey is because we wanted to get some perspective on how the community felt around services, service levels, and the frequency. So what I would suggest council is that we are going to reflect the results of the survey in our analysis, but they are not necessarily going to drive any opportunities. What it will be is it will be used to inform council when we say this is opportunity X, this is what the survey had said. I can appreciate council that there's a point being raised with respect to granularity. What we find is that invariably we need to arrive on a happy point between the level of detail that we ask and not having a survey that is overly burdensome. And what you will note, for example, is in the Coburg Community Center, we didn't break it down by type of recreational program that the facility supports. We considered it one facility as a whole. So there is balancing. Similarly, when you look at some of the other services, we didn't break them down into as much detail as we could have. If we do for the waterfront in the marina, then the question then comes down to, should we be doing it for other cases? And what this then leads to your worship and council is a comment about whether we need to start the survey over again. And as I've mentioned, as of last week, there were 122 residents who took the time to respond to the survey. I don't think it would be fair to them to throw the results out to start again. And so based on that, I'm happy to progress for a couple of reasons. One is, I believe that the level of granularity is sufficient for the purposes that we have from a service review. I know from my discussions with council, um, and I'm looking around the names to, to remember everybody, we have had a discussion specifically around the waterfront and the marina and issues around expansion. And so council is already aware from our perspective as to what the community thinks and the fact that there's different views. And so because of that, we're not recommending to split the survey. We're not recommending to rerun the survey. We would suggest that for our purposes and based on what we need it for, it's sufficient for our use. So we would like to continue as is. So Councillor Chorley, I'm sorry for using long answers for your questions, but that's basically our response. Thank you. 
Does that help, Councillor Chor Chorley? Yes, and thank you, Mr. Poloni, for addressing that concern raised by uh, some residents. Thank you. Okay. Any others from members of council? Seeing none, thank you, Oscar, once again. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Mayor, if I may, just in one point. Um, oh, means? What I would like to say is this. I know it's early days, and I know there's things that are going to change. There are a lot of things that your municipality does right. And I, and I can appreciate that um, sometimes municipalities aren't necessarily held in the highest regard. And I can appreciate that there's, there are efficiencies and other changes to be had. There's no doubt, but I, I'd be remiss if I said, you know, there's some things that your town does that we're impressed by for what it's Thank worth. You. Thank you. Very much appreciate it. Uh, Mr. Larmer, back to you. Next year, worship, we have delegations. And first in the delegations, we have Adam White, a COBRA resident, regarding the status of Victoria Park Beach, options of reopening following August 31st, 2020. Just going to make sure that, sorry, Adam is. Adam, can you hear us okay? Yes. Perfect. He's ready, Your Worship. Okay. Adam, I'd like to welcome you as a relatively new citizen to Colbert. I appreciate the fact you've taken time to present, and I will accord you some additional time to ensure your points are well listened to. Please proceed. Thank you. Thank you, you very so much. I'd just say good afternoon, everyone. I support opening Victoria Beach on September 1st under special protocols as I have mine in my recommendation, like continued fencing with designated entrance and exit points and crowd control. Staff can, staff has the mechanisms, I believe, to open Victoria Beach, and they can even emulate how other municipalities have opened their beach. I feel that Washrooms should be open just like other municipalities because I feel it offers a more cleanlier environment and a lot classier than having other parties. Furthermore, having Victoria Beach ready for Labor Day weekend would be a boost in morale and image for all of the town of Culver. There is no evidence that there is a great threat to others when in groups respecting space and being outdoors. Numerous municipalities have already opened their beaches. If there was this great threat of spreading the new coronavirus in Colbert, then why are the marina and campgrounds open? Why is downtown Colbert actively marketing a pedestrian friendly downtown on the weekends? 
As of August, as of today, the workshop of counselors, the community data on confirmed COVID-19 cases in the HKPR district health in an area is 31 cases, 30 resolved, two hospitalized, zero death, zero current outbreaks. In a Zoom call on Tuesday, August 18, with Lynn Noseworthy, she confirmed that contact was needed for 15 minutes or more, and Jen's mission is specific to closed environments with significant contamination. Your worship counselors, people are people. People get sick. Being sick isn't a crime. If somebody gets the new coronavirus, it doesn't mean we should stop treating them like a human being, but show compassion and hope they get well soon. We are all doing our best to wash your hand, covering our mouth when they have to cough or sneeze. If citizens feel that they should wear a mask, keep wearing one. It's your free choice. If citizens make their conscious choice that wearing a mask harms their safety, then it's their free choice. I get it. Citizens are concerned. And everybody's emotions are valid. It's unfair to use our emotions and opinions as a thought and to compare other epidemics in other countries as a fact that Victoria Beach should stay close. There needs to be community engagement and when other position someone takes, it's important to engage with one another with an open mind, listen, and calmly argue opinions. We all want to breathe, stay healthy, enjoy life, raise our children in a beautiful town of Culver and be a caring community that trusts each other. We don't need to be living in quiet desperation. That's why open dialogue and mutual stuff is needed. Your lesson and counselors that community has been responsive and stewards of resilience. 
for five months. We are in stage five. Anthony Victoria Beach when we leave extreme pressure on the citizens' mental, physical, and social health and well-being. Earlier this month, the town's park and recreation advisory committee said the beach area are an important public asset to the citizens of Culver. Public opinion and fears aside, there is no scientific data to suggest COVID-19 transmission effects in the open air environment, even more so when the public remains socially distant and respectful of others' stasis. As we have seen in our community, putting into practice all summer long in other areas, such as parks, forests, stores, and restaurants. Your worship, counselors, it is your leadership and responsiveness to the values of civil society that will be judged. Will council be making a decision based on opinions that hold to a current view of the world or recognize the evidence that a perceived great threat isn't there and allow the citizen way to enjoy themselves with their great group respecting space. I believe that Society gets through a crisis by remembering the things that unite us through the heart. Victoria Beach is the heart of Caldera. Together, said counselors. I just want to share my heart with all of you and everyone watching that it may be weird, but I love you all. Thank you for my delegation. Um, Adam. Um, I just want to ensure, are you finished at this point? Because I'd rather not interrupt you. Um, Mr. Rosho, I believe he's finished his delegation. Okay. Thank you, Adam, for your uh, compassionate plea to our council. 
questions of clarification from members of council? Seeing none, Adam, this will be discussed later tonight. So thank you for your delegation. Mr. Larmer. Yes, next year worship, we have delegation number two and we have Paul Pagnuello. Regarding the status of COVID Victoria Park Beach options of reopening following August 31st, 2020 and the establishment of a Coburg Beach task. I'm just gonna ask Paul to uh, just unmute here. You're still on mute there, Paul. Very left hand. There you go, Paul. Okay. Uh, Paul, your worship, Paul. Deputy Mayor, members of council. Uh, I'm Paul Pacmello, a corporate resident. This afternoon, there are two aspects regarding the beach that I would like to address. The first deals with when it should be re reopened. The second deals with a longstanding contentious issue amongst residents, and that is the free use of the beach by non-residents of Coburg. You're aware of my personal position, which I shared with you in June, as to why the beach should be closed for the summer. As a council, I would like to take this opportunity to thank you for the carefully, for after carefully considering uh, every public submission and coming to a unanimous decision uh, that put public uh, health and safety first. Before you are four options that staff have suggested. The first is to extend closure to October the 17th. Second is to keep the beach closed only on the weekends to October 17th. The third is that to expend, extend closure only until after Labor Day weekend and reopen September the 8th. And the fourth is another option to be determined by council. But before examining them, let's uh, first consider the backdrop as we quickly come to the end of a sunny, hot summer. This would have been a great year to cool off and enjoy our beach. What we learned is that public health and safety was the top priority for the vast majority of Coburg residents. Although disappointed that our beach was off limits, we also found that it was not the end of the world. As we enter the fall season, the Public Health Agency of Canada says that the direction COVID-19 takes could go in a few different ways this fall and winter, ranging from small spikes to a worst case scenario where Canada experiences a massive second wave in the fall that overwhelms the healthcare system. The experts say it's clear that over the next year, we will be battling rises and falls in case numbers and may again have to lock down as a result. In terms of the four options, unfortunately, the staff report does not provide a costing for each, which would have been useful in arriving at an evidence-based decision. Under each of the four scenarios, it should be noted, there will be no lifeguards. Although washrooms remain closed, porta potties will be available. Without the um, benefit of comparative cost, um, my recommendation to council today is to choose option one, and that is to keep the beach closed to October the 17th. Let me explain. I recognize everyone has the urge to return to some degree of normalcy. It's been a long, hot summer and people have given up their beach um, and would like nothing more than to get it back. But after considering the province has just expend, extended its emergency order until September 22nd, and there has been another bump in Ontario cases, we should uh, consider uh, taking a break until next year and we must exercise extra caution. This bug still has no cure and the risks continue to outweigh the benefits. It is a terrible disease that attacks the organs and we should not rush reopening uh, at this stage um, in, in our process. 
The second part of my delegation deals with what everyone knows is a longstanding irritant for the vast majority of Coburg residents and businesses, and that is free access to, Ontario, to Victoria Beach by people who are non-residents of Coburg. Although past councils have sidestepped the issue, it has become clear during the public debate on this summer's beach closure that the subject can no longer be ignored. We need to examine the issue in its entirety from several different aspects. And when studying the issues related to fairness to local residents, I sincerely hope we can have an adult conversation about it. Let's be clear from the outset, charging non-residents an access fee is not a human rights, social justice, or racism issue, which some people will always raise as a defense or strategy when they object to something. My recommendation would be to establish a task force to examine the following and to develop a policy recommendation for consideration by council. Composition. The task force should be comprised of, Ontario, of Coburg residents, uh, representatives of the DBIA and Chambers of Commerce, and staff would provide research and secretariat services. The task force should report to Emily Trorley, coordinator of Parks and Recreation Services. Its duration would be three months with the deliverable of December the 1st, 2020. The work plan would identify all costs and revenue related to Victoria Beach and other town owned beaches, identify those costs specifically related to beach tourists, including advertising, quantify the benefits and disadvantages of hosting beach tourists versus visitors, survey of downtown and other merchants on beach tourist traffic and the dollar spent, Compare practices of other Ontario municipalities with lake access. Compare the practices of other municipalities outside of Ontario. Compare the practices of federal and Ontario beaches. Identify all impacts on residents of beach tourism. Develop a pricing model for distinguishing between uh, residents, other Northumberland residents, uh, non-residents such as Durham region, GTA, et cetera, and develop a parking model for handling beach traffic. The deliverable would be to provide council with a full report and recommendations by December the 1st for approval in principle. And then council would uh, consider public engagement on the, pro, uh, on the proposed recommendations prior to final approval. I thank you for the opportunity to address you today and would be pleased to take any questions you may have. Okay, thank you, Paul. Questions of clarification, starting with Councillor Burrell. Thank you for your presentation, Mr. Pag Pagniello. Um, just a question though. Uh, who did you, I didn't quite hear who you said should be on that task force. I got the DBIA, the chambers, did oh, you say? representatives of the DBIA. Uh, right. Representatives of the Chamber of Commerce, um, citizens, uh, residents um, uh, from various walks of life um, uh, should be on that task force. Um, and uh, in terms of uh, staff, uh, staff would provide advice on secretary of services. Thank you very much. Okay. Other questions for clarification? Deputy Mayor? Um, Paul, I wondered if you could send your uh, comments to the clerk for distribution to council. You had some really good points in there, and I'd like to reread it. Yeah, uh, okay. if you could do that. I will, that, uh, will do that uh, this evening, if you don't mind. Thank you, Paul. <clears throat> Other questions? Clarification? Seeing none, thank you, Paul, for your delegation. Mr. Larmer? Next, Your Worship, we have a third delegation. We have Lydia Smith and Michelle Peterson uh, for Serve Our Heritage Harbor regarding the Town of Coburg's Service Livery Community Survey. I'll just make sure I get them both up there. I know, make sure. 
Então, na minha. Can you hear us, Michelle? Yes, I can. Hello. Okay. Ready, Your Worship. Welcome to both of you to Council. And uh, Lydia, will you be starting off? Yes. Thank you. Good afternoon, members of Council, the general public, media, and town staff. My name is Lydia Smith. My associate is Michelle Peterson. We are both Coburg residents. <clears throat> Thank you for the opportunity to address you this afternoon on behalf of Preserve Our Heritage Harbor. Um, I didn't have an opportunity to uh, present a preamble based on Mr. Uh, Poloni's comment, and I'm very glad that Councillor Chorley asked the question. Um, I would just like to say that uh, slide 13, I, I agree that you need to look at the big picture and not get down into the weeds, into the minutia. If you look at slide 13 of Mr. Poloni's presentation, the marina was broken out uh, as a standalone business unit, as was the campground uh, and the Cobra Community Center. So there's already precedent for that. <clears throat> um, Preserve Our Heritage Harbor, POHH, it is, is a citizen's advocacy group that supports preserving Coburg's Harbor from development threats. Our mission is to preserve Coburg's Heritage Harbor by supporting ecological sustainability, preserving the waterfront as a tranquil natural space and supporting a vibrant, safe and walkable community. We liaise with local officials and organizations to help our community to be more informed about developments at Coburg's Heritage Harbor. We are here to request council's immediate assistance to direct staff to amend the serious flaw in the Town of Coburg's Service Delivery Review Survey currently being conducted by KPMG. POHH Citizens Advocacy Group is concerned that the methodology being used in the Municipal Service Delivery Review Survey, which was published August 11th on Engage Coburg, is flawed and should not be used to identify areas of priority for the community as it relates to Coburg's waterfront. The primary flaw with the survey is that it asks respondents to assess use and value for money on a category that combines the marina, proposed travel lift, and all other waterfront facilities. So here's an example. One of the questions was, tell us how often you would typically use the following town services. And it was, you know, one rarely or never, two once a year, et cetera. In that category, the marina and waterfront facilities were put together. Uh, another question, do you believe that the level of services, and I'm gonna put this in brackets, for the marina and other waterfront facilities, um, close the bracket, provided by the town are appropriate for the community? The methodology of the above questions is flawed because it doesn't provide response <laughs> with a way to indicate that they believe funding of the marina proposed travel lift may be too high, while funding for other waterfront facilities might be too low, or vice versa. The pay for use seasonal marina proposed travel lift services are quite different from year round other waterfront facilities that are used by all. Um, the marina is a standalone business unit like the Cobra campground and should be treated as such. Other waterfront facilities would include, but not limited to items such as waterfront revitalization, West Beach boardwalk maintenance expansion, restrooms, walking paths and cycling trails, garbage and recycling, East Pier restoration, recreational facilities, environmental stewardship and remediation, landscaping, flood protection, pedestrian safety, sidewalks and access roads, non-marina community groups. Coburg residents have consistently been speaking up about how important preserving the waterfront is to our community. We've repeatedly objected to increased taxpayer funding for expansion of the marina and proposed enhancements such as travel lifts into the West Harbor because those pay for use services have limited seasonal use and they only benefit one user group. They don't equally benefit all town residents. POHH believes there should be a separate category for other waterfront facilities, much as there is for the campground and for parks. We just make a note that it's not clear in the parks category how much, if any, applies to the waterfront. 
By failing to segregate the marina proposed travel lift from other waterfront facilities in this survey, the wrong questions are being asked. This could lead to inaccurate data. Rather than providing information that will allow the community council and staff to make informed strategic choices regarding waterfront services, decisions could be based on flawed or skewed survey results. Given the importance of the waterfront to the community of Coburg and the impact of its funding on generations to come, it is imperative that accurate survey information be gathered. I'll just make a, a note here. I, I did notice Mr. Poloni said that that was just part of what they were going to do, going to be doing. I, I didn't have the benefit of hearing his presentation. Um, POHH calls for council to direct staff to immediately amend the survey to separate the marina proposed travel lift from other, other waterfront services. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Lydia. Questions of clarification from members of council? Okay, seeing none, Mr. Larmer, thank you, Lydia. Back to you. Next, Your Worship, we have delegation number four, and we have Brenda Quinn, over resident regarding a Coburg Beach Victoria Park. I'll just ask Brenda to unmute herself. There we go. Okay, good. And there you are. Sorry, Brenda, I had to look in the uh, top. Thank you. Uh, welcome to council, and we look forward to your delegation. Thank you, Mayor Henderson. I've never, I haven't done one of these for a long time, certainly not this way, so bear with me. Um, hello, my name is Brenda Quinn, and I've been a Coburg resident for many years now, a Northumberland resident for my whole life. I appreciate this opportunity to make my presentation to you, Mayor Henderson, and the Council of the Corporation of the Town of Coburg. The purpose of my presentation today is to request that the town set up a task force which will be charged with coming up with a workable procedure to make the Victoria Park and Beach area free for Northumberland residents and ensure that all non-Northumberland residents pay a fee to use the park and beach. My rationale for this recommendation is as follows. Until my retirement three years ago, I was a downtown Coburg retailer, a business my husband and I started back in 1988. We currently own a commercial building in downtown Coburg um, with a large parking lot, as well as a residence in Coburg's East End, and we pay some pretty hefty property taxes into Coburg's coffers. Over the past two decades, I have become increasingly aware and concerned about the great influx of out-of-town visitors who are putting tremendous pressure on our town's resources by flooding to our downtown beach and Victoria Park areas during the summer months. For the most part, these people have one destination in mind, the beach and or Victoria Park. They bring their own food and supplies, then they set up, have picnics, sometimes illegally barbecue, and then in many cases leave their garbage strewn around the park area. If parking areas near the beach and park are full, then they migrate to the nearby residential streets, parking haphazardly, often blocking driveways and leaving behind a lot of garbage that these homeowners must then deal with and pay to dispose of, or their alternative is to park in downtown commercial parking lots illegally, I know this firsthand, preventing legitimate customers from parking in these lots and again, leaving their lovely garbage deposits behind when they depart the town at day's end. Not to mention the huge cost of lifeguarding the Coburg Beach. I understood this to be budgeted for this year, when they were talking earlier about whether to close the beach or not, the budgeted at $194,805 for lifeguards for just a three month period in 2020. I've also been informed that if a town supplies lifeguards for their beach, then the town could potentially be held liable should something happen to someone that these lifeguards aren't able to help. In these days of people suing everyone, that's a pretty darn scary scenario. 
It would be worth looking into the beach liability issue should the town not hire lifeguards, but post at the beach as use at own risk, lifeguards not on duty, but supplied water safety information packages, similar to what is supplied in Ontario provincial parks. Ontario parks do not provide lifeguards. Okay, these out of town park and beach users do not shop downtown for the most part. They do not go to area restaurants. They don't stay overnight in area hotels. They come, enjoy the beach and park, sometimes by the bus load, and then depart at the end of the day back to their homes in Durham, Clarington, Clarington and Toronto, leaving the garbage remnants of their day behind. The cost for town maintenance staff to pick up all this garbage and dispose of it on a daily basis must be very prohibitive. And it's totally ridiculous that Coburg residents are footing this bill day in, day out for up to five months each summer. For me, this came to a head back in June of this year when I was absolutely horrified to hear a figure of $377,000 mentioned by Dean Hustwick, the Director of Community Services, for operating the beach for the months of June, July, and August in 2020, when Council was talking about whether or not to close the beach this summer due to COVID. 19. I would imagine that for a normal year, this figure would be much higher as the season would be longer. And going forward in subsequent years, you've got to think that with all the COVID things that have to happen, the sanitation and everything, the, the costs are going to be even higher. We must get control of the rapidly increasing crowds who are coming to the Cobra Beach and Victoria Park each summer. In subsequent summers, I would also imagine the stress to our beach and park will be increased as more and more communities are realizing, just like I have, the costs and liabilities involved with opening their beaches and parks without control of the influx and repayment from out of towners for the services and amenities provided and thus these other communities will come up with their user pay systems themselves. So if we have a free open beach, what's going to happen? They're all going to come here. In view of what I have just de detailed, I reiterate that the Council of the Corporation of the Town of Coburg strike up a task force as detailed earlier, including local residents and town town business and property owners. And as uh, Mr. Pedinello pointed out, this would then report to Councillor Emily Chorley in her role as Coordinator of Parks and Rec Recreation Services. And then town staff, um, as Mr. Pognello pointed out, could provide research and um, secretarial services, whatever would be required uh, in an, on an administrative front for the task force. The task force's main goal would be to make the beach and park area self-supporting with a user pay system. At this time, I would like to put my name forward as a volunteer for the task force once it's established in my role as both a Coburg resident and a downtown building owner. The time to act is now, so as to have this working model well in place by June of 2021. Thank you. Okay, thank you for uh, your presentation. Questions of clarification? And uh, I, just to, from my point, Brenda, have you submitted, I believe you have to the clerk already? What, my whole presentation? Yes. No. If you could consider that, that sometimes is very helpful to council. Oh, you sure. Yeah, no, I can do that right to away. Mr. Larmer, then he can filter it out to all members of council. Absolutely. I'll do that right away. Um, clarification questions? See none. Thank you very much, Brent. Sure. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yes. I went too fast. Councillor Chorley. Thank you, Mayor Henderson. Just a quick question. Um, first of all, thank you, Brenda, for your presentation. Can you help me understand your suggestion that Northumberland residents uh, should have free access to Victoria Park and the beach? You did mention that Coburg residents flipped the bill. So I'm just wondering if you can explain a little further why you are suggesting Northumberland residents should have free access. Okay, because we're a two tier government here, I thought that possibly some of the money that would come in flow into the town to um, help with the beach um, operations would come from the county that may not be totally wrong. That's why I put that in there. It may be totally wrong. I don't know. 
Okay, thank you for that. And uh, just so you know, everyone, when we say Northumberland, we do have Northumberland uh, people who live beyond Coburg but are part of our tax base and own properties and therefore are legitimate taxpayers. So maybe the point of Northumberland would have merit certainly in those cases. Is there any other clarification? Seeing none, thank you, Brenda. And Mr. Larmer, back to you. Thank you. Next year, worship. Um, we move into delegation action and just for ease of yourself as chair, um, most items one, two, and four are on the agenda for discussion. Um, item number three is not, if you want to do delegation action for that. But again, that's up to you, Chair and Council. A delegation action, let's perhaps go to number three, presented by Lydia Smith and Michelle Peterson. I'll put that under uh, general garment. So off to the Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Um, I actually think this should probably be more um, under Parks and Rec, but um, I guess we'll receive it for information purposes and ask the clerk to get the um, the uh, presentation by Lydia Smith for review and uh, uh, look for look when we have the pre the um, um, presentation and discussion on the beach um, later this evening. Perhaps we can revisit this, but at this point, just receive for information purposes until we have further information. Thank you. Uh, any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Carried. Um, Mr. Lomer, back to you uh, for uh, Councillor Beebe's uh, motion at the beginning. Your Worship. I believe if I could just correct me that the motion was when we get the parks and recreation services that that item on their parks and rec which has a recommendation to council regarding um, a particular uh, connotation of his task force would come right after the discussion regarding the August 31st update on Victoria Beach. I okay. think right now we're just going into planning development services. So I just want to make sure Councillor Beattie I was not misinterpreting which seems I may have your concerned did the mr lamer have it correct yes your worship the clerk uh, summarized it correctly okay as always thank you mr larmer and i appreciate your guidance so we're off to uh there is no general government services tonight so we're off to councillor Beatty under uh, planning development services Thank you, Your Worship. Item number one is a memo from the Director of Planning and Development regarding the deferral of development charges for business number 2725632, Ontario Limited, 2642301, Ontario Inc., 2642301, Ontario Limited, and 2362219, Ontario Limited, Boulder Corporation. And this is for 311 through to 325 University Avenue West and 387 William Street, Coburg. The action recommended is that council receive the report from the Director of Planning and Development for information purposes, and further that council approve Balder Corporation's request to waive the interest charges on the 10-year deferral of development charges, which was previously approved by council, in the amount of approximately $110,600 for the mixed affordable market rental apartment project at 311 to 325 University Avenue West, 387 William Street, subject to the finalization of details by staff. Did the director, Mr. Milgasha, did you want to speak to your report at all or pretty self explanatory, but any comments you wanted to make to council? Um, uh, through you, uh... Madam Chair to uh, Council, um, uh, certainly the uh, the report they have before you um, uh, provides uh, some level of detail with respect to Boulder Corporation's uh, request. Uh, back in April of 2019, when um, Council did approve their 10-year uh, deferral of their DCs, there was no direction given with respect to uh, interest. Um, and under the um, newly amended uh, Development Charges Act, um, municipalities may, uh, but don't have to, may uh, charge interest on uh, deferrals and installment plans. However, uh, just given the uh, the fact that uh, it is a uh, an affordable 
and rental uh, housing project that uh, meets council's strategic plan initiatives as well as the housing strategy. Um, it was felt that this uh, waiver of uh, interest would be um, would be very appropriate in this case and is also consistent with the recent approval of uh, council on the affordable housing solutions corporation deferral uh, on monroe street so um, i'd be certainly happy to answer any questions that council may have thank you mr mcglashan for those comments uh over to questions of questions from members of council uh council bureau Thank you. Um, through you, uh, Councillor Beattie, to uh, Director McGlashan. Um, when was the new DC changes made? Like, when were, did they start? And second, um, was that near or close to when we deferred the 600 and something thousand for 10 years? Um, yes, uh, sorry, through you, uh, Councillor Beattie. Um, the initial um, amendments by the provincial government to the DC Act was approximately, I think it was just after um, April of 2019. I believe it was around June, possibly of 2019, uh, through the More Homes, More uh, Choice Act uh, of 2019, Bill 108. However, um, it was further amended through the uh, COVID-19 Emergent uh, Economic Recovery Act, uh, which is Bill uh, 197, uh, given royal assent uh, approximately one month ago. Uh, it did change a number of the um, previously amended DC Act provisions um, based on further consultation and review with municipalities, uh, particularly with respect to community benefits charges. Uh, so uh, there's slightly new um, rules and regulations on community benefits charges, but nothing uh, with respect to interest um, defer on deferrals uh, at this point. Can I have a follow-up, please? Thanks. Um, then my question is, is before the new laws came into effect, were they okay with paying the um, interest rate? Uh, through you, uh, Madam Chair, and when you say they, um, are you meaning I mean, Alder? sorry, the Balder. Um, so um, I don't Alder. believe they understood that uh, interest would be charged uh, back in April of 2019. Um, it was only fairly recently that um, staff had indicated uh, to Balder Corporation through our development agreement that uh, there, there would be interest charged. So that led to the um, follow-up letter by Balder to ask for the deferral of the, or sorry, the waiver of the, uh, the interest. Last, can I, one more question, maybe? Sure, unless, are there any other questions oh, yeah. from members of council, just to Wait. equity of time, Councillor Bureau? Yeah. Any other, Councillor Darling? Uh, yes, thank you, Councillor Beatty. Um, if I could ask Mr. McGlash just to uh, bring me up to date, the, the deferral was in the amount of 600000 for um, the fees, is that correct? Uh, yeah, yes, that is correct. Um, okay, now that, that amount, um, is it to be paid back? I know there was a report, I just can't um, bring it up right now, and I was trying to think, is it that amount got to be paid back all at once, or is it spread over a period of time? after the 10 years has uh, expired. So through you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, so the, this, the Development Charges Act does allow um, rental housing providers to a number of options. Um, they are allowed automatically to qualify for a six year payment plan, which would be annual installments uh, of that $650,000 over that period. So approximately $100,000 a year. Um, however, uh, the Balder Corporation had uh, requested and received from Council a 10-year deferral payable in full after the 10 years. So their uh, proposal would be at 10 years, they would be refinancing the project and they would obtain uh, funds to pay back the municipality in full that amount. Okay, very good, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Darling, for that question. Other members of Council before I go back to Council Bureau? Okay, Council Bureau? So if, if we didn't approve this, would this stop the entire project? Well, Councillor Beatty, um, through you, uh, to uh, Councillor Bureau, I believe the, the interest um, payment, if required, could jeopardize the viability, the economic viability of this project. Um, I believe Mr. Um, Akbari, in his letter uh, to the town, 
has indicated that uh, they did not uh, budget or foresee this, uh, this interest charge through their financing um, uh, before the uh, CMHC um, program. And uh, at least my understanding is, now it's not um, my uh, direct knowledge, but my understanding is that uh, this could potentially impact the, uh, the economic viability of, uh, of the project. And if, if you were, do recall as well, through the affordable housing strategies uh, for Coburg and the county, that um, uh, certainly uh, any incentives provided by the municipality are um, very uh, worthwhile in terms of helping them achieve economic viability in a lot of these cases, because they are um, uh, providing for rents that are below um, average market rent. So they do, do require some subsidy, whether it's from uh, CMHC through the Rental Housing Protection Program or through other means of incentives like the municipal fees and charges. Councillor Bureau, any follow-up questions? No, thank you for that clarification, definitely. And perhaps just on that theme in case for members of the public watching, um, possibly with my questions to um, Director Davey, Interim CEO Davey, um, and possibly just a quick education for the public that is listening. Uh, the, the deferral of the interest charges, there's no economic impact, no financial impact uh, to the town by waiving that. That's just interest charges we just wouldn't be collecting. It's not like we're putting out that, that funds and not recouping that, correct? Uh, yes, uh, Councillor Beattie, I would agree with that. I mean, in terms of the development charges, basically what happens is that that money flows in, it goes directly into a DC reserve, and then it's used to fund uh, projects that have been identified in the development charges study as uh, having a growth related element. And at that point, the funds are taken out. So what would happen is that Every five years, that development charge background study is updated. And what's taken into account at that point is the, obviously the balance in the reserve fund. So if those funds haven't been there, then the fund hasn't been accumulating interest. And so there, there could be potential uh, for a shortfall that would then have to be made up, say, in the next five-year period as a reflection of development charges. So it's it's a, it's sort of a circular calculation, if you will, that every five years that interest or lack thereof would be taken into account in reestablishing the next uh, development charge. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. And I, and I think to that point and to what the director was saying, the, I know I, for one, the importance of um, ensuring that this project is economically viable for their various um, components of their applications to CMHC and moving forward here in the town, in addition to, um, you know, the stimulating the rental stock, you know, these are the tax revenue that the town will benefit from over, over the next decade by the time that their development charges um, maturity date comes upon us. Um, and then really to just how this project and much like the Monroe Street project um, these are the initiatives we, we need to see that's addressing the detrimental rental vacancies that our community is currently experiencing. So um, I do hope that this is something that members of council will consider to, um, to continue to provide support without any you know, financial repercussions to, um, to the town. So with that said, um, any other comments or questions of clarification, Councillor Darling? Yes, thank you, Councillor Lee. I guess uh, to Mr. McLaster, or maybe the CAO, I'm just wondering, um, you know, with the amount of money that's being deferred and waived and whatnot, where the checks and balances are here, does uh, CMHA provide, or CMHC providing the funding, are the checks and balances for the revenue streams and where the money goes and everything, is it part of CMHC to do the checks and balances to make sure that everything's above board and everything's working well? To the director, quite possibly. Sure, I'll, I'll give it a stab. Um, yeah, so uh, Councillor um, PD, uh, through you. Um, yeah, CMHC administers their um, rental housing construction initiative programming. So they ensure, they audit the uh, the proposal to ensure that the uh, the rents are affordable over that 10 year or, or the life of the uh, the program. And uh, also to ensure that their, their finances are in, in order through um, 
uh, what they, I believe they have, I can't remember the name of it, but it is a financial analysis that is undertaken by the proponents that must be approved by um, TMHC in order for them to obtain the funds. So there are uh, checks and balances with respect to the CMHC's program. And then there are checks and balances with respect to our component, which is development charge deferrals and fees and such that we would have, um, you know, checks, uh, uh, sorry, check boxes to say, here's when the, um, the fees are due and payment shall be provided. So there's kind of a two, two tiered system there. Thank you, Mr. Chris. And the reason I ask that question, I just want to make the public, uh, reassure the public that, that, you know, we're just not throwing money out the window here, that there are checks and balances in place. And this is a very worthwhile and, and needy cause that all levels of government are supporting. Thank you. And just, uh, Madam Chair, just one final thing. All of the municipalities provisions and with respect to deferrals of permits, fees, levies, and development charges are included in their development agreement with the municipality, registered on title as well. And there are definitely lots of uh, legal checks and balances in the event of default um, uh, of those fees. Wonderful. Thank you to the director and Councillor Darling. I think those are important points to raise um, just to ensure the confidence of, of the public. So uh, unless there's any other questions or comments, I will call the vote on the motion um, as presented to council. All those in favor? Against? So carried. Thank you very much. Item number two is also a, a correspondence from Boulder Corporation regarding a request for an extension to council resolution number 463-19 on the deferral of the applicable building permit planning application, tree and parkland fees and levies for the subject development for 311 through to 325 University Avenue, Coburg, Ontario and 387 William Street, Coburg, Ontario. The action recommended is that council grant the extension of an additional six months deferral for the payment of applicable building permit, planning application, tree and parkland fees and levies for the subject development of 311 to 325 University Avenue, Coburg, Ontario and 387 William Street, Coburg, Ontario being until June 2nd, 2022. Is there any questions or comments from members of council. Okay. Seeing none, I'll call a vote. All of those in favor? None opposed, it's carried. Thank you very much. Item number three is a memo from Planner One of Heritage regarding the notice of complete application for site plan approval for 66 Strathy Road, Coburg, Smart Centers, REIT. The action recommended is that council receive Receive the action recommended that council receive the notice of completion complete application for site plan approval for 66 Strathy Road Coburg and for Smart Centers REIT and refer the application to the planning development for a report planning department for a report. Any questions or comments from members of council? Seeing none, calling the vote. All in favor? None, none opposed. So carried. Item number four is a memo from the Planner of Heritage regarding a notice of complete application for site plan approval for Block 94 Lonsbury, Lonsbury Drive, Coburg, and this is for Al Rose of Stellwood Homes. And the action recommended is that Council receive the notice of complete application for site plan approval, Block 94 Lonsbury Drive, Coburg, for Al Rose Stellwood Homes and refer the application to the planning department for a report. Any questions or comments? Councillor Chorley. Thank you. A, a quick question through to Director McGlashan. When your report comes back on these 10 plex units, will it be possible to include any information about sustainable features or accessibility features? For you, uh, Councillor Beattie, yes, uh, I can certainly have that in the uh, report, Councillor Chorley. Thank you for that uh, detail, Director. Okay, any other questions on the motion? Seeing none, all of those in favor? None opposed? Motion's carried, thank you. 
Moving on to item number five, and this is a memo from the Secretary of the Heritage Advisory Committee regarding Heritage Permit Application HP 2020-017 as submitted by TVM Group to permit new ground floor windows and doors on the existing storefront at property known municipally as 1 King Street East Coburg. And the action recommended is that Council endorse the recommendation of the Heritage Advisory Committee and grant a heritage permit HP 2020-017 to permit the new ground floor windows and doors on the existing storefront at the property known municipally as 1 King Street East Coburg, subject to finalization of details with planning staff. Any questions or comments from members of council? Deputy Mayor? Um, <clears throat> thank you, um, Councilor B. I'm just wondering if the Heritage Committee uh, saw a proposed vision of what the building would look like. Uh, did I hear, did I, when I read the report that the brick was going to be painted black um, to correspond with the windows and the doors? I mean, clarify that, please. I just would have liked to have seen what the building is proposed to look like instead of what it looks like now, which we can all see. I'm just wondering if, if, if the Heritage Committee got any further um, insight into that. Mm -hmm. The colors, of course, would be um, approved to fit into the heritage um, palette of, of, the, of the downtown. Um, I can appreciate how a visual of the new color would, um, would, would help members of council. Uh, I, I know it wasn't presented to the Heritage Committee, um, but I see that the director has put his hand up, so he's better suited to, um, to address your question. Yes, through you, uh, Councillor Beatty to Deputy Mayors again. Uh, so the painting of, um, of the building is actually not of the facade um, of the brick or anything. It's actually the Terrazone uh, stonework that is around the, uh, the trim okay. on the main level. It's very, very similar to what um, the building directly across the road to the north of Victoria Hall is with that black uh, pane. And there is some stonework that's kind of around that window framing that would be black as well. But the, uh, the brickwork around the building is not to be touched at this point. Thank you, because I'm always hesitant to paint brick because it never seems to work out that well. Thank you, sure. uh, Director McLash. You're welcome. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, I'll call the vote. All in favor of the motion? Opposed? It's carried. Thank you very much. Item number six is the memo from the Secretary of the Heritage Advisory Committee regarding Heritage Permit Application HP 2020-021, submitted by Paige Burnett to permit a roof replacement repair of four chimneys and one chimney rebuild and custom flashing and a partition wall repair at the property known municipally as 245-247 Division Street, Coburg. The action recommended is that council endorse the recommendation of the Heritage Advisory Committee and grant a heritage permit HP 2020-021 for the proposed roof replacement to replace the existing asphalt roof with a metal roof, conduct chimney repairs for four chimney repairs and one chimney rebuild, repair the north partition wall and install the custom blend my apologies, and install the custom bent chimney flashing for the property known municipally as 245 to 247 Division Street, Coburg, subject to the finalization of details with planning staff. And I'd just like to um, reinforce the um, gratitude from the Heritage Committee to Ms. Burnett for taking on this initiative and restoring some of these key features of what um, many of us, um, I think, can agree is an iconic part of our downtown heritage landscape. So I just wanted to publicly um, emphasize those remarks by the Heritage Committee. Uh, that being said, any questions or comments, members of council? Councillor Bureau. I thank you. Um, I'd also like to appreciate that any building owner in Coburg fixing up their buildings is definitely appreciative and it definitely does need repairs. My question is though, on the safety factor of the metal roofs. So two, two questions that I have. One is the recent house fire that had a metal roof. Um, the, I don't know if there's any new fire regulations or, or codes like that for the metal roofs. And second, and this is a big safety concern, is the snow falling off the metal roofs in the winter? 
Uh, being downtown for years, I see it all the time. Every every winter, we get a big snowfall, and when they come crashing, it's like 50, 60 feet from the air, and it comes down. So, I guess my question is: Is there any way that we can make that a safer? Um, I know it has the snow bar across, but that doesn't help. Uh, is there any way that there is something we can improve on this to have the safety of our residents walking downtown? Mm, that's an important question, Councillor Bureau, and obviously, um, you know, all all designs would get the necessary vetting and approval from the various um, safety requirements and building inspections. Uh, but uh, once again, the director of planning is more well suited to uh, answer your question. Yes, a very good question through you, um, Councillor Beatty, Councillor Bureau. So I'm not certainly an expert in fire code or building code matters. However, uh, metal roofing is an accepted and um, uh, proven uh, roofing material uh, under the Ontario Building Code. So the fact that it does potentially create some fire fighting issues, uh, that's certainly something uh, the fire department, I'm sure, are, are very well aware of and how to, to deal with those. But with respect to the uh, safety of snow loads and, and um, stopping the um, with the stop bars on roofs, I've, I've actually seen the stop bars work quite effectively uh, myself. I have a, a pretty good um, view across the, uh, the road of some metal roofs and you're not going to be able to stop every uh, bit of snow, even on asphalt roofs, hanging over eaves troughs or or other um, types of um, pre preventative measures, but the, the stop bars and and uh, keys, I guess you could say, in the uh, in the roof lines of these metal roofs are actually quite effective. Um, they're not, as as I say, they're not. I don't think you'll get anything that'll stop all snow from from falling from any roof uh, in the downtown that angles towards the uh, municipal street. So I really I really don't know what the uh, the answer would be, um, but those are um, certainly uh, Proven um, and accepted methods for uh, for snow dams to uh, you know to help help at least mitigate any uh, major damage. If there are circumstances in the downtown where snow does uh, appear to drift or accumulate over edges of buildings, uh, the bylaw enforcement officers and the property standards bylaw officers do take note of them, and will either work with the property owner to have it safely uh, removed or or, um, or dropped from the site safely. Um, or the town will actually implement emergency measures to actually do it uh, all along the uh, the street front. And I'm sure you're aware of them, Councillor Bureau, ice, icicles hanging down off of eaves troughs that are frozen and melting, um, poor, poor uh, eaves troughs, snow drifts that happen all the time. So I don't know if you'll ever, ever 100% prevent or mitigate any potential safety issue. It's just a matter of, um, you know, managing the risk, identifying it when it, when it does crop up and when you see circumstances and, um, and try to, um, try to uh, resolve it when you do see them. But I, I've certainly seen the, the snow dams and they seem to work fairly well. Thank you. That addresses your concerns, Councilor Bureau? Yeah, yes, thank you. You're welcome. Mayor Henderson. Uh, thank you. Uh, to add to, uh, Director McGlashan's point, uh, perhaps a, an area for a phone call to inquire. Um, uh, the one I'm going to refer to is Quebec City. Quebec City is uh, an international, almost UNESCO level type heritage site. You can imagine the amount of snow that they must get. Um, it's considerable, believe me. And I do believe they have a program in place when they do roofings uh, based on uh, the significance very much for the reason expressed by Councillor Barreau. So maybe a phone call out of curiosity to see what program do they put in place because I've been there many times. I go there annually every year, every winter for the past 10 years. And I can tell you they actually have programs where companies come in and remove the snow off the roofs very much for that reason to prevent a significant injury. But again, I want to reiterate their snow conditions are far superior to ours, but perhaps a recommendation or a follow through. I can't speak to the details, Director McGlashan, but I do know they, they must have some kind of degree of program because I see this annually uh, when I am in Quebec City. So just uh, to your point, Councillor Barreau, it's the only place I've been to 
um, personally that I've seen an actual pro appears to be a program in place, but unfortunately I can't speak to the details. So just FYI. Thank you, Mayor Henderson. We'll look into that. Thank you for that, Your Worship. Any other, any other questions or comments from members of council? Seeing none, calling a vote in, a calling a vote for the motion on the floor. All in favor? Opposed? Seeing none, carried. Thank you. Item number seven is another memo from the Secretary of the Heritage Advisory Committee regarding Heritage Permit Application HP 2020-022 as submitted by Catherine Spavins to permit an infill development of a detached dwelling on the subject property located on the vacant lands adjacent to 163 Sydenham Street, Coburg. And the action recommended is that council endorse the recommendation of the Heritage Advisory Committee and grant a heritage permit HP 2020-022 to permit an infill development of a detached dwelling on the subject property located on the vacant lands adjacent to 163 Sydenham Street, Coburg, be approved subject to the finalization of details with planning and heritage staff. Any questions or points of clarification to the director on the, the request for permit as in front of us. Seeing none, calling a vote, all in favor? Opposed? Seeing none, it's carried, thank you. Item number eight is another memo from the very busy secretary of the Heritage Advisory Committee regarding a heritage permit application for HP 2020-023 as submitted by Peter G. Nodder on behalf of St. Peter's Anglican Church to permit a roof replacement for the property known municipally as 240 College Street, Coburg. And the action recommended is that council endorse the recommendation of the Heritage Advisory Committee and grant a heritage permit number HP 2020-023 to permit a dark gray metal shingle roof replacement for the property known municipally as 240 College Street, Coburg, subject to the finalization of details with planning and heritage staff. Questions or comments from members of council? Seeing none, calling a vote on the motion, all in favor? Opposed? Seeing none, carried. Thank you. Final item under planning and development is a notice of my, from myself uh, regarding the Brookside Youth Center located in the town of Coburg. And the action recommended is whereas the town of Coburg has identified people and places as two of its strategic pillars to help build a vibrant, accessible, and inclusive community and whereas the town of Coburg is committed to identifying lands to support priorities as set out in the town of Coburg's official plan, and whereas the town of Coburg is interesting in pursuing partnerships with all levels of government to achieve its goals, and whereas Brookside Youth Center has been operating a reduced occupancy rate for several years, and whereas Brook my apologies, um, scrolling here. And whereas the town of Coburg taxpayers have been inquiring about the future of Brookside Youth Center, now therefore it be it resolved that the town of Coburg send a letter to the Ministry of Community Safety and Correctional Services and the Ministry of Children, Community and Social Services to request the province of Ontario to provide an update to members of Coburg Council on the status of Brookside Youth Center including options for initiating the disposition of the buildings and or lands in which the center occupies and further that this resolution is forwarded to the honorable todd smith the minister of children community and social services mpp david Pacini, and northumberland county council and just a few words before i open it up to questions or comments from council members uh, just some context for uh, this motion since this term of council began in December 2018, not a week goes by where I don't have a conversation with a citizen about Brookside. The intention of this motion is threefold. The first is to demonstrate to our community that we are listening to them while exploring ways in which government owned assets and land can be better utilized for a vibrant and vital Coburg. 
Secondly, it's also to hold all stakeholders accountable for progressing the conversation forward about Brookside's future while keeping the public informed. And finally, to work with the government of Ontario in their own initiative to review how their assets are being utilized and how underutilized assets could be disposed of to strengthen community planning at the municipal level. I will open it up to members of council for questions or comments. I'll go with Councillor Darling, Mayor Henderson, and the Deputy Mayor. Councillor Darling. Um, thank you, Councillor B. Uh, personally, I'd just like to thank you for bringing this notice, notice of motion forward. Um, as you're well aware, you and I have discussed this issue in the past, and uh, I was going to give it some time while the COVID was on, but uh, I guess there's no time like the present to bring it forward. So I'd just uh, like to give you my personal thank you on moving this forward. Well, and thank you, Councillor Darling, and it was actually those conversations that, you know, uh, to, to move forward with it. So, so thank you for that acknowledgement. Your Worship. Through you, Madam Chair, I, I perhaps like some direction from uh, Mr. Larmer, if I could. I believe uh, the Attorney General or Solicitor General would be involved in this conversation. Um, because of the realignment at the ministry. And I'm also suggesting to you, if that is correct, that we'd also include Minister Steve Clark, because I know for anything to go through, through any sub um, department, it would have to go through his overview to the premier. So I, I would also ask that he would be included specifically along with your other members. And if I could ask Mr. Larmer, just for a bit of clarification uh, on my point, that would be helpful. Um, through your ch you cha chair to um, council, um, I think maybe adding the, the, the premier on this, premier's office, in order to distribute to his ministers as he sees fit in his cabinet is a good option as well too. Um, but I, I have to double check. I don't think as a ministry of recreational, I think it's actually the solicitor general now. Um, they've rearranged ministries, so I have to double check that. Um, but I'm pretty sure that that doesn't exist as solicitor general, um, which is the Honorable Sylvia Jones. Um, we can definitely include the Minister of Steve Clark there too. So if that's if that would satisfy, and thank you, um, Mayor Henderson, for bringing up those points and the clerk for clarifying. I'm happy to, unless Mayor Henderson, you're wanting to make an amendment, but if you the latitude, um, I'm happy to add uh, those three suggestions to um, whom this no, letter would be forwarded to. So that would include the Premier's office, Premier Ford's office, the Solicitor General, Honorable Sylvia Jones, as well as the Honorable uh, Steve Clark. Hey, thank you for that. Thank you for raising it. To the clerk, myself adding that to the motion is satisfactory, correct? I don't need an amendment for that. Uh, you no, know, that, that's okay. You made that change um, and that's correct for me to send off. So I think that's fine. Okay. Uh, before I go to the deputy mayor, does members of council want that last sentence reread as to who we're notifying? Um, or it's clear that the three members, okay. Uh, mayor Henderson, anything else? That no, was, that, that was I'm very point. supportive of uh, your uh, first year notice motion, now the motion. I just want to ensure we're covering uh, the critical people in the deliverables, but thank you. You've noted that, so I have no further questions. Okay, thank you. I just didn't want to uh, oversight that before moving on. Uh, Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you, Councillor Beattie. I also want to um, uh, support you in your notice of motion. I know shortly after uh, MPP David Piccini was elected, um, I also hear from people on a regular basis as to what is being done or could be done with Brookside. And um, I did mention to Piccini that uh, it would be good to tour the facility. And I know, I think it was a year or so ago that uh, the MPP Todd Smith did tour the facility with Mr. Piccini and they were actually surprised at what they found um, and I, I look forward to I have been in correspondence with him after your notice of motion was posted so I, I will be watching this actively um, the town of Coburg only gets four thousand dollars in uh, tax in lieu uh, for this huge huge facility compared to what some owners pay double that so I think it's time 
certainly time. I'm, you know, disappointed that they didn't take the initiative on their own, but these wheels do run slowly and we don't know if we'll have see any kind of change before the end of this term, but I'm hoping we will because I think we, this, this council, this community needs some, um, some answers to what is going on there and how it could be better uh, utilized for our town. So thank you again for bringing it forward and I will support it. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. I so do appreciate those comments. Any other comments or questions of clarification from members of council? Seeing none, calling a vote, all in favor? Opposed? Carried, and that's all for planning and development, thank you. Before we go to uh, public works services, um, I would like to suggest to you, Mr. Larmer, that we take a five to eight minute recess. And I'm looking at the clock, we're nine minutes away from being at this for three hours. And I know we still have a, a time before us to finish the agenda. And that again is followed by another closed session of council. Is anybody uh, not supporting a five to eight minute re or five minute recess at this point? See no objections. And Mr. Larmer, if you could just note, we're taking a five to maybe eight minute max uh, recess, and then we'll be back to continue. Do I need to put a motion of a vote on this or is, is this acknowledged through you? I would vote on it. Thank you. All those in favor? Carried, thank you.
turn it back to Worship. Okay, thank you, Mr. Larmer. And I believe we're back to you under um, Public Works Services, item number 10 in the agenda. Yes, Your Worship, we have Chair Councillor Brian Downing. Thank you, Mr. Larmer. Uh, item one from Public Works is a memo from the Director of Public Works regarding the Northumberland County Professional Consultant Services roster. And the action recommended is that Council approve for the Town of Colbert to participate in the Professional Consultation Services roster program, which contains successful firms on a roster that have proven qualifications and project experience that the Town of Colbert can utilize for professional consultant services on an as needed basis. And further that Council author authorize the preparation of a bylaw to be endorsed and presented to Council for adoption at a regular Council meeting to amend purchasing bylaw number 012-2012 section 4.5 to allow for professional consultation services roster firm contracts to be exempt from the current threshold and further that staff prepare a biannual report to Municipal Council summarizing all contracts awarded under the professional consultation services roster program. At this point, uh, is there any questions or concerns? Uh, Councillor Beatty, then Councillor Chorty. Thank you, Councillor Darling. Um, I appreciate the initiative, possibly either to you or through you to the director. I have a curiosity, are there, do we know if other member municipalities uh, in Northumberland, um, like what municipalities have already approved their participation in this, in this service program, in the service roster? Um, I'll ask the director if she has any. We discussed it earlier today. I don't know if she found out if there was any that have actually approved it at this time. Director Wills. Sure, through the chair. I, I haven't confirmed who has um, been approved to participate in the roster. I do know that all the member municipalities were, in, were uh, anticipating asking for the approval at the very least. Um, I don't even think the county has put forward their, um, their final approval yet to their council, but uh, again, the intent is that all of us are participating. That actually is a, is a good benefit for why we got so much interest from 50 different consulting firms is when we put all of us together, those firms know that there's a big pool of work to be done throughout the county, not just for the county, but all the member municipalities too. So it's, so it's a big attracting factor for the roster program. Okay, uh, does that answer your question, Councillor Beatty? Um, Councillor Chorley? Thank you. A question through to Director Wills. I'm just wondering, in a typical year, not a COVID year, but in an average year, roughly how many consultant tenders would you expect to administer? So um, I guess it can change from year to year, of course, but from my department, I would say we're definitely at less than, say, a half dozen. Um, I think there's a few numbers in the report that sort of identify typical ranges of of project values that sh would show our consulting component of that construction value being over 50,000, which is generally what this roster is covering is, is everything outside of our typical um, purchasing policy over $50,000. So um, for me, it's uh, most likely under half a dozen. Um, and uh, I would think we would utilize it the most out of all the departments. You might see your parks and rec, um, community services department utilizing it a couple of times a year. Uh, depending on um, on the priorities of council, of course, um, and that's that's about it. So yes, not not highly utilized, but very useful resource to have. Thank you, um, Councilor Bureau. Thank you. And to my understanding, um, council would have already pre-approved in the budget any project that these consultants would be utilized for. Correct. Director Wills. Through the chair, yes, that, that is definitely correct. Um, I should note also though that occasionally there's emergencies or um, unusual circumstances that arise throughout the year where we may have to, um, our time is of the essence and we need to get a, a consultant on board quickly. So this roster program is also um, a tool for anybody, any department within the municipality that might need to quickly get a reference um, and quotes. So having this wide range of, of um, categories available to choose from is really helpful for things such as um, 
you know, the Monk's Cove wall was a, was one that wasn't budgeted for, but it came up and we needed to find somebody quickly. Having a roster like this would have been helpful to, to know who to go to quickly and not have to worry about their qualifications and making a really, it's an open um, RFP process. So, um, but typically uh, the, the intent is for pre-approved, already gone through the budget process um, projects. Um, and again, all of the quotes that we would still be receiving through the roster program, as long as they're within the approved budget, they can go ahead. But if they go over budget, we come back to council anyway. Thank you. Okay, Deputy Mayor. That was my question. If, if basically uh, the projects go over budget, that they would come back to council because I am not in favor of sole sourcing. I never have been and I never will be. Um, this opens the door for anything between 100,000 and 500,000 to just be um, committed um, by the staff. And you mentioned half a dozen. So I'm not quite sure other than a roster of, of um, firms that have been chosen, vetted, by different uh, members of staff. My concern is I would, I heard that the count, the counties has not yet um, approved this. And so my question is why are we getting it before the county's government actually approves this? And, um, and frankly, I would prefer this to wait until our new CAO is in place because this is an important decision and I can't support it today on this premise because 100 to 500,000 is a lot of money to just so potentially sole source. So thanks. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Hendrickson. Yes, uh, through you chair. I just want to say to my knowledge, uh, this has not come uh, to the County Council yet. Uh, they do have a lot of these systems in place at the Council at County Council. Um, I know they bring, I will say quarterly, but if it's not, it could be semi-annually, where they bring any reports to Council that's been spent from 100 to a 500,000 range, um, and that is shared with County Council and Council. Uh, but again, I just want to reiterate uh, that point. Uh, the other point I want to reiterate, uh, based on what I know from the County Council, um, if a supplier applies for qualifications and is not selected for inclusion on the roster, um, generally they are not permitted to apply for a one-year period. But with that being said, um, we also have, if you did not qualify, I believe you're also able to resubmit for requalifications under the same standard. So I want you to know, at least at the county level, the same standard is used throughout the entire process. So from that sense, at least it's fair and equitable uh, on how they're uh, treated. So I just thought I'd express that to you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Charlie. Yeah, thank you, Mayor Henderson for clarifying that. That was um, also one of my questions was really about equity. And when you create a roster, making sure that everyone has equal access to those opportunities I know in municipal government and in companies really across the country right now, discussions about equity and making sure that we aren't building barriers to participation is a very important consideration. Um, I do have a number of concerns with this. I just wanna clarify with Director Wills to make sure that I'm understanding it correctly. <clears throat> this really represents quite a departure from our current um, purchasing policy. Um, under our current policy, any kind of procurement under $50,000 can be signed off by the CAO, but anything over $50,000 does need to come to council for approval. Um, under this system, it's quite different. Um, consultants can be sole sourced uh, up to a value of $100,000. So decisions made by the administration and uh, for contracts between 100 and 500, half a million dollars, um, uh, some bids would be sought from those companies on the roster, but in some categories, there's as few as two companies in that category. So that means with as few as two bids, um, a decision could be made and a half million dollar contract could be granted, which would not come to council at all for approval. And that decision would not be made in the open um, and the public would not be aware of it either. So I do have some concerns about transparency and accountability 
And uh, I can see that in setting up this roster, staff are looking to make their processes quicker and a little bit easier. And I can understand that. Um, but I think it's really important that we also are very careful in the way we do business to make sure we're thinking about uh, value for money, for example. If so few bids are being sought, even if we set the budget for, for a particular project, are we really gonna get the best value, the best price for those consulting services? Um, my other concern is about ethics. I'm really questioning whether the ethics criteria is strong enough. Having looked at the companies that are on the list who have been approved, um, for me, it indicates that there isn't a strong ethics criteria simply because for one example, SMC Lavalin has been approved and is on the list of companies. And um, for those who aren't aware, SMC Lavalin um, has been facing criminal charges of fraud and corruption. And last year, the company did plead guilty to their fraud charges. So um, I think it's very important that we keep our procurement processes open and transparent, that they come to a seven person council that everyone in the community can see who is being awarded a contract and can raise objections at that time if they have any concerns. Um, and the other concern I have is that, uh, that this is such a, a departure from our existing policy. I definitely think that our purchasing policy is out of date and I think it needs to be updated, but I really think we need to update our policy first and then decide whether we're going to participate in a program and that program should comply with the policy that council sets. So at this time, I can't support it. Um, it's interesting to know that the county perhaps still has some work to do on this. Um, maybe improvements can be made to it, but at the moment with so few contracts, perhaps only six, um, six procurements using this process, there's just not enough gain in efficiency to offset the tremendous loss for me of transparency and accountability. So my suggestion would be to instruct staff to update uh, the town's purchasing policy and bring a draft to council. And uh, just to finish a quick question through to the clerk, I know we have had discussions about this in the past. Are there any plans to bring forward some updates to our purchasing policy? Uh, through you, Chair, to the member of council. Um, I know the treasurer has been working with the treasurers at the upper tier level um, regarding kind of a, an update to purchasing policy. I'm not sure how that's gone, but um, as part of our bylaw review and something that's going to start get started here to make sure that we're back on track, you know, we review those that are five to 10 years old and this is approaching its ninth year. So it's going to be up for review anyways, as part of that mandate. Um, I know that I will be bringing stuff forward here this term of council to um, update the, the RFP and kind of process, not necessarily the person policy itself. Um, but I know that um, um, the CAO has been uh, with the treasurers working on something. Um, and I think we know and directors have provided, um, you know, ideas that, you know, something that we should look at and start to um, amend and approve and maybe bring something forward. The CEO has anything to add? Thank you, Mr. Larmer. Um, Mr. Davey, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, no, that's correct. I mean, there has been a process in place uh, <clears throat> in recent months to have all of the um, seven lower tier municipal purchasing policies align uh, more closely with the county purchasing policy so that uh, all eight, if you will, are somewhat in alignment. Um, and that uh, that process is ongoing. Um, I will say that, that um, the, the concept of when council sets a budget, uh, they have approved that amount of spending. So in terms of modern purchasing, there is a, a theory that uh, projects, as long as they come in within budget, um, would not necessarily come back to council for approval on the award of the tender, uh, unless there is a reason such as they've gone over budget. So that, that tends to be the way that uh, sort of the current purchasing uh, policy is going. Uh, it tends to speed up the process. Uh, and then there would be that report back to council uh, 
uh, listing, say, all the projects in the last quarter or something, how the tenders were awarded, who got it, and then that provides that transparency piece back to the public as to, you know, who is getting these contracts and and uh, how they were awarded, that sort of thing. So, but yeah. Okay, thank you, Mr. Um, at this time, if I may, um, Director Wills, can you answer, um, seeing we're the first ones that be presented this policy, um, I don't see here a real need to, to make a motion or move in haste. Um, would there be a problem if we deferred this? Um, is it holding up any projects or if we deferred it till after the new CAO come in and we had a look at it a month or two down the road after the counties decided whether they actually want to use the same uh, policy? Uh, no, there's there's no um, rush to push this through. Um, if I may um, give a little bit more um, explanation of some benefits and um, try to clarify the differences between our current practice and the roster program. Um, the, as, as I noted, the intended purpose is to streamline the procurement um, process for consulting services. The counties use this system for many years. This isn't new for them. Um, so I, uh, even though they haven't brought the report to council necessarily, um, it's not not because it's new and it's not because they're they're waiting for anything it's just they haven't gotten around to it yet however um if you would like to wait until then that's that's completely your prerogative um under current practice staff um are, are still able to single source or sole source um to consulting services if it's justifiable We're, uh, and also to obtain quotes for projects that are under fifty thousand dollars without going back to council for final approval. So essentially the main difference here is with the roster is we're um, increasing that value up to 100,000. Um, and then um, under the roster program, consulting val uh, projects valued between 100 and 500,000, we have to obtain a minimum of three quotes, which is what we would typically like to do under an open RFP process anyway. But technically we can open two tenders um, valued between 100 and five or any, any value at all. Um, so I also, I, I can definitely understand that the, the 100,000 to 500,000 is, is a wide and very high range of values. I would uh, try to explain that in a sense of from the county's perspective, they have much larger projects to consider for their consulting services. They have um, many large bridges, thousands and thousands of kilometers of roads that they might lump into much, much larger scale consulting projects, much larger than the town would ever have. Um, so that was probably where they came with up with 100 to 500 and it, um, I don't want it to scare you away because a project, something like some, that kind of project for Coburg, $500,000 worth of consulting services would have to be a construction value ranging from about 5 million to over $12 million. So that's pretty unlikely, if not never going to happen for, um, for Coburg, um, that, that helps, uh, typically the size of the design of a road reconstruction, um, for design services is under 50,000 for my department. Projects that may require consulting services valued between 100 and uh, 500,000 construction service, or sorry, for um, consulting services for us might be um, our King Street West bridge design next year and something like the Midtown Creek ponding area. So, or um, the East Pier project. So projects like that are pretty, few and far between, um, and they would amount to construction values of over, over a million dollars. So Cobra doesn't have an awful lot of these on an annual basis, if any at all. So um, it's, it's mainly for the smaller projects that would be under 100,000 for consulting services. Um, I did consider a bit of a, a hybrid system to see what it would look like if the projects valued between 100 and 500,000 came back for award um, for um, council's consideration. Um, and when I was thinking of what the report would actually look like, it would literally be a list of prices. Because at this point, we already know the list of consultants that have been approved. Everyone can see that now, it's public record. Um, if there's an issue with any of the consultants that have been uh, evaluated and added to the list, anyone can bring forward a complaint or a, a comment or concern at any time uh, throughout from, from now forward, now that the, the list is, is public knowledge. Um, so really my report essentially would be a list of all the prices because there's no other component involved in a bid at that point. Um, all of the company profile, the CVs, 
the um, similar experience, um, everything else to do with the bid process has already been done. It's just the prices. Um, so we would really just be, there's not an awful lot of reason that I can think of um, that we would not be awarding to the lowest price. So um, my reports, my biannual reports would come back and say, you know, here's, here's the six quotes we got or the three quotes we got, here's all the prices. And you can see that we awarded to the lowest bidder. Um, I think that if we didn't, that would, that sort of defeats the purpose of, of the roster program. Uh, we, we wanted, we needed the um, consultants to come in with their competitive prices because we can choose whoever we want to get obtain, to get quotes from. We don't have to ask for all of them and we don't have to ask uh, a quote, ask for a quote from the highest, um, for the consultant that has the highest rates. So um, that's, uh, we don't have to share the work equally amongst all of the roster um, uh, firms. So there's no, there's no obligation to use any of the firms that have higher hourly rates provided. Uh, and just one final note um, about the integrity criteria. Um, there, there was not an integrity criteria involved in the consulting evaluation system. That's never been a component of any evaluation system for, um, for in my um, knowledge. So staff wouldn't have the capacity to evaluate a consultant's integrity since there's no approved methodology or process for us to do that. So I would expect that if there is a specific companies listed on the roster that are brought forth to council or uh, members of council that don't believe they should be awarded any projects, I can only recommend that the town obtain some legal advice on that um, before moving ahead with um, potentially banning a, a consultant from our roster list when they have successfully completed the evaluation that was um, that was required of them through the roster program. Are there any other questions that I can help clarify? Well, thank you, Director Wills. Um, Mayor Henderson. <clears throat> um, in this case, I, I'm interested in both items. I appreciate what's been put forward for streamlining because that's very critically important as we move forward. But I'm also very cognizant uh, that we're approaching the eighth or ninth year with a very outdated purchasing policy. And I had an indoctrination at County Council with an expert in the field of purchasing. And he made it very clear that one of the critical components of any organization is to make sure you have an up-to-date purchasing policy, which aligns with three words he used, ethics. Um, he also used the aspect of ensuring uh, that the policy was environmentally sustainable moving forward and did it have a component of an e-procurement or electronic component built in where we're going through IT. And at the same time, it formed the foundation. So I'm of the belief that if we can work towards a policy and amend it accordingly, uh, who knows whether this would be a budget item, but it's critically important we get it right. And if we do, then I think we can streamline it at the same time. So the pieces fit together brilliantly. And I believe this would then would serve the municipality perhaps for another, let's say five or seven year run before the next review. I just think it's time that we go back and look at our policy. I have to admit during my time, I, this is my third term of council. We have not taken, I believe the time that would be required to look at our purchasing policy in, in the new light of where we're going. Um, so again, I'm, I'm all for both parts, but I think it's time maybe we step back and, and try to do this. And I would ask through Director Wills, if she feels or through Mr. Larmer, that it would come with a budget item, because I know it can be intense to look at the organization's purchasing bylaw then I'd ask that perhaps that could come back to council, what that would look like. Okay, Mr. Larmer, you have anything to add on the mayor's comments? Okay, um, did I see Councillor Charlie, did I see your hand again? Yes, I'm just wondering, I think the that <clears throat> Mayor Henderson had a question that was, was that a question directed to Director Wills? 
Um, it was either to Director Wills or Mr. Larmer, because I know the two worlds blend. Uh, but if we were looking at redoing our procurement policy through an initiative, I'm just wondering if in time it would come with a, a budget allocation for consideration for 2021. I apologize, I don't remember us um, having that previous budget. Um, Director Wills, do you feel there's a budget uh, requirement for uh, purchasing policy? Um, through uh, through the chair, I, I don't believe so, um, but I would have to leave that with um, with uh, the clerk and the interim CAO to decide. Okay, thank you. Um, after hearing the comments, any more comments here at this time? After hearing the comments, um, you know, this, this was put on the floor for discussion. We've had good discussion on it. And um, I too am not fully confident at this time. Um, the county, like you say, the county hasn't approved it. It's not something we need to rush into. We're in the process of maybe looking for a new CAO. So I would like to amend the motion myself and, and defer this to you know, three months down the road something like that where, where the new CAO is in place, we maybe have time to look at a new purchasing policy, see what the other municipalities do, whether they're in favor for it, and maybe if it can be honed a little bit. So at this time, I'm gonna make a motion, amend the motion to uh, defer this for three months. If I could ask uh, Mr. Larmer a date three months down the road, a committee of whole. Through you, Chair, it looks like we're at um, October 26th or uh, November 16th. So October 26th will take us to the three months, but a little extra would be November 16th, 2020. Well, I'll, I'll amend the motion that we defer it to the November 16th committee as a whole. Just, um, you chair, the, the motion is just to refer this item. There's been no reference to the person policy at all, but just this item to the yes, correct. 2020 meeting. So um, the member is withdrawing the first motion and putting this other motion on the floor. Is that correct, Chair? Sorry, could you repeat that, please? So you can't amend your motion. Um, you can withdraw the motions on the floor, and you can put a new motion forward, which would be a motion to refer. Okay, then I'll withdraw the first one and advance the motion to refer to November 16th, Committee to the Whole. Okay. Um, any other questions or concerns regard for this? Seeing none, I'll call the vote. All in favor of the motion to refer? Opposed, if any? Carried. <clears throat> okay, thank you, Mr. Larmer. Um, item two is a memo from the Director of Public Works regarding Downtown parking, Cobra Transit Fares update in the town of Cobra. Um, yes, Mr. Larmer, I forward you a, an amendment to that motion. If you could put it up, please. So I've made an amendment to the motion on the agenda. And again, it's for discussion purposes. The action recommended the council permit staff to re-implement the collection of fares for downtown parking and transit when Victoria Hall is open to the public and further that staff ensure that a minimum of two weeks notice is provided to the public through all available media outlets and further that council direct staff to continue with the reduced service hours for transit and a savings of $5,400 per week until December 31st, 2020. And at this time, if I could ask Director Wills to uh, just comment on how the uh, reduced tra uh, transit hours have worked and uh, we'll go from there. Sure, through uh, the chair to uh, members of council, I um, I put forward a, a few options for you as there are several. Um, I haven't to date had an awful lot of comments from the public about the reduced service. It seems to be functioning and providing adequate service um, for what's needed right now. Um, as everything continues to open up, that might change. And when it does, I will continue to keep you updated if um, I think it is a 
um, if there needs to be a change, but um, you do have the option of, of continuing with um, the reduced service to save a little bit more money. Um, you have the option of continuing the reduced service and um, charging fares again to recover some revenue for the remainder of the year. And we also have a combination of that um, collecting fares or not, while also um, going reverting back to our regular scheduling for transit. Um, and then through that, there is also another option about the extended transit for accessible service. So lots of things to consider. Um, and I'm sure maybe we'll get some feedback after this report comes out, but I wanted to provide you with our ridership stats over the last many months. You can see that it's uh, very slightly increasing, but still staying very low. Um, and again, we've, we've had very little usage of our wheels service. Um, we're still only allowing one person per vehicle and it's, it's still, it's doing okay. We, again, we haven't had very, any complaints at all about, about um, capacity on our buses. So, um, oh, I'm sorry. So I guess that's, that's basically my summary. If you have any questions, please, I'd like right. to clarify. Thank you, Director Wills. I'll go to Councillor Biro. I can appreciate um, the cost savings of the transit that you put forth, Councillor Darling, uh, cost savings of 5400 a week. Um, I do have a little couple issues with this. One is a lot of, now that we're in phase three and everything's opened back up, a lot of people have used alternative methods to get to, to work. Um, for instance, if they work at any of the big box stores, they're open from the shift start in the morning, go till nine o'clock at night. Um, and I understand that the weather is good right now, so they may be able to walk and it's sunny and bright out. But for me, um, I think when they, when they I think we need to move back to the regular hours and the extended hours for the accessibility. A couple of points. Um, one, for people to use the transit again to go back to work. Two, um, for the accessibility part, we can only take one passenger at a time. And I think we need to extend those as well. There's more stuff that's opened up. And in, I, I'm a big advocate for making sure that um, anybody who needs accessibility transit can use it. Um, second, I'd, is there any accessible taxis that are out there at this moment? I, I don't think that there is. This would be the only way that they would be able to, to get around town. And I think it's our duty as, as a council and as a town to make sure that they can do that. And to me, I'm going to be not voting for that, and um, I would be, I will be uh, putting forth a motion to uh, choose option two. So, okay, that is uh, that's my my feeling on this. Thank you, Mr. Councilor Bureau. Uh, any further comment, Councilor Beatty? Thank you, um, Chair. Uh, I hear Councillor Burroughs, um, the need for ensuring that when ridership is in full need of regular service hours uh, to be there. Uh, however, I do appreciate the director providing us with some statistical validation as to perhaps option one. I'm wondering if um, we could just, instead of going till December 31st, I know it's kind of time taking to be reviewing this every 30 days, but given either where we're at further in September or the impact of the weather, because um, I don't know if we should be incurring costs, the ridership demand's not there just yet. Um, and the director has been pretty good at communicating when that need increases, decreases. I'm wondering if it would be, um, if we could strike a balance to maintain some cost saving efforts uh, in light of our current snapshot of ridership, uh, but to reflect Councillor Briero's uh, um, statement of need for possible uh, future increase in demand based on weather. So I'm wondering if December 31st is too long of a timeline and if we could review that. Again, I know it's exhausting to do it every 30 days or so, but I'm wondering if that would be a balance of uh, making a decision based on current data 
um, and then uh, cost saving measures that again to leave it open for uh, for us to respond to increased demand. Thank you for your comments. Any further comments from anyone? Okay. Um, nobody's commenting on whether we want to see an amendment for the 30 days. Do you want to make an amendment, Councillor Beatty? Sure, I will to uh, the the amendment, Councillor Darling. Um, just to your amendment instead of December 31st, I, I suppose to uh, September 30th, or if the clerk could give me a an exact committee of the whole date to uh, to align. That would be to align with. October 5th. Okay, so the uh, just a simple notice to amend would just to uh, uh, for this to go until October 5th or to review it on October 5th. Okay, well, uh, there's no, okay, Councillor Chorley. Yes, I, I do share Councillor Bureau's concerns about the lack of transit options for those who need accessible transit. But I also noticed that the statistics that Director Wills provided us with show a tremendous drop in the demand. I'm just wondering if it's possible um, to reach out to all of the registered Wheels users just to get a better sense of whether in the coming weeks they feel that they would uh, need that increased transit service or um, perhaps some individuals are opting to stay home um, out of concerns for the spread of COVID-19. So is it possible for us to get some more information over the next few weeks? I guess we could put that question to Director Wills. What would the transit department be able to contact, I'm not sure how many actual users we do have for the wheels bus. Would they be able to contact if we, if we delayed this till October 5th or passed the motion till October 5th, would we be able to find out, you know, do we proceed at the same rate or implement it back to what it was after October 5th because we know the ridership is gonna go up? Um, through the chair to members of council, I'm just considering what that would look like. Um, we have over 600 members. We typically do mail outs when we have to provide information, which is a very onerous process. I, we could make some just phone calls, but it would be random. I don't think we could call everybody to ask uh, what their preference is, but is, if that would be sufficient to, to do some, some calling to some of our members and ask them, that's... Um, there's 600, just to confirm, there's 600 wheels users? Members, yeah. Members. Probably okay. about 300 active users. Okay, so we called the high, uh, the ones that use it the most. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, yes, would that be considered? Thinking. Okay, thank you, Director Wills. Um, Councillor Bureau? So, um, to me, I, I understand what everybody's saying, and I think that's great. But I do think that we're limiting these users where they have no other mode of transportation. Like I, I understand cost savings and I understand all that kind of stuff. But generally, the feedback that I get from users is that it's booked and you can't get it and you can't get a ride. So I don't understand why we want to limit the usage. We have 300 people that are, are possibly using this and we're going to say no. Nope, Everybody done at five o'clock. Oh, you couldn't go grocery shopping today or tomorrow, then we'll have to book it again. We have to treat everyone equally. And this is our way of treating them equally. If we don't do this, I, I'm not in support of, I understood when it was, when we were all shut down, but this is phase three. These people work, they have to go to medical appointments. They have to go grocery shopping. This is how they get around. And I don't understand why we'd want to limit this particular thing. I'm all, I'm all set for cuts and finding out different ways to cuts to save money, but this is not one of them, in my opinion. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, well, right now we have an amendment on the floor um, to look at this again, to pass the motion as it says being amended to October 5th. Um, I see no more comments. I'll call the vote on the amendment. Uh, so all those in favor of the amendment? Against? Okay, so the vote is five to two. So now I'll call the, uh, call the vote on the motion, the amended motion. 
there's no further comments. All in favor of the amended motion. Can we get a re recorded vote on this, please? Um, yeah, I guess we could ask the clerk to. And maybe if I could, I'll have the clerk put the motion back on the screen and I'll read it again as amended. Bear with me for one moment, please. Absolutely. Also, Charlie, go ahead. Just as we wait, I'm just wondering if Councillor Bureau could share a little bit more um, of the feedback he's received from citizens. If Councillor Bureau has heard from citizens that there is a real need for extending our hours for accessible transit, just wondering if he can share a little bit more, maybe of how many people he's heard from. Me, I've heard um, from, I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, but uh, I have heard that there is problems being able to book appointment because they're already booked. And so they have to make other arrangements. And I do know that um, in the standards of uh, accessibility, we have to treat everyone equally in, in, um, in our community. And we have to, it is our duty to make sure that we are able to get them to their appointments and uh, have transit. This, it is, it's our duty to do that. That's one of the rules. I mean, Director Wills, am I wrong on that? We treat everybody equal. But if I make Director Wills with treating everybody equal, we're doing that at this point. I mean, it's a, it's the same for wheels as it ever is for nope. everybody else at the time cut off. There, there is a difference because um, there's no accessible taxis. So they have no other way of getting around. If there is a way that a person that doesn't have mobility issues or need the wheels, they can go and call a taxi at any time. We are limiting that, we don't have that. If we did, that'd be a total different story, but we don't. True, but I mean, yes, I agree with you there, but after, I mean, what's the difference in hours, Director Wills, from currently to what it was? Is it two hours? Um, We're running. We're, um, we're running three hours last Monday to Friday. And, and, there, and you said there was no, they were not running on wheels on Sunday and you said there was no call for it on Sunday. Right, so the, the accessible service is still running the same amount of hours that conventional is. Um, the difference being that um, the wheels bus can only carry one person and their attendant if needed. So that could be an issue with um, booking. Although with an average of three to four maximum per day, you know, that's like three to four hours of service. So um, there could be definitely some changes to people's routines where they may not be able to go do what they would like to do at the time that they would like to do it. But there are other times during the day that they may have to rebook. Um, I, that might be a bit of a, a communication issue between our provider and the user that uh, they haven't been provided enough information to know that there's other available times during the day. And I'll make sure that we talk to them about that to make sure that when a time is, is uh, requested and it's full, but the next available time is offered um, because you know utilizing three or four people a day in total on the wheels bus is, is not filling the bus for the entire day. It's not booked for the entire day. Okay, that, that clears things up immensely. So you're saying that there's a possibility of eight, eight to 10 rides a day that could be used over a seven right. day period which would be say 60 to 70 rides or 70, 80 rides where they're only using uh, 20 or 30 of them. Okay. All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Larmer. Okay. Just um, for you chair to the director of just wanted to confirm she, for the conventional transit, there is accessible options for the transit for conventional as well. So Correct. 
um, I just want to cut the, the counselor regarding the accessibility standards and requirements. They are met. Um, we have what's called integrated uh, accessible standard, which is under the accessible for Ontario's with the Disabilities Act. And what that is a specific regulation that separates conventional and then non-conventional and specialized transit services. The wheel service is a specialized transit service, um, which does a specific um, um, task for those that register for the purpose. But the conventional transit buses do have accessible requirements and those that need that um, would be able to board the conventional bus um, at those times in order to get the trip. The difference is they would be going from bus stop to bus stop um, rather than to the pick up to the door to the front of a business or appointment. I just also want to tell council that um, we do have an accessibility coordinator that's uh, starting with us in the next few weeks. This individual will be looking at everything, working across departments as well as the public works department um, as well as through myself. So a lot of this stuff will be worked on, will be addressed and will be coming to council. Um, also engage the accessible community 100% um, what it is now as well as the committee too. So um, we're getting there and this will be a dramatic and I'm telling you right now that myself and the Director of Public Works will be the advocates to make sure that um, it's above standard, but we are currently right now meeting accessible requirements. Thank you. Okay. Um, Councillor B, or pardon me, Councillor Chorley. I just wanted to add one further comment. I know it's a big ask, but if it's possible at all, Director Wills to make some phone calls and at least do an informal survey to really understand the demand and whether the limited hours for accessible transit, whether that is really proving to be um, a difficulty for our residents. Uh, we do have one week of reflection until we come back next week for regular council. And if there's any way to give us a little bit more information, that'd be really helpful. <clears throat> and I would also say to any members of the public, if you experience real difficulty with the limited transit hours, please do get in touch with members of council so that there's the option for us to revisit this decision next week. Director Wills, you had your hand up. Oh, sorry, I just meant and us. They can call us too. <laughs> oh, 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 and call us. Yeah, yeah. If you could call the transit department, you may be able to sort it out <laughs> right away without calling a council and having it, uh, you know, get relayed through several people before uh, it gets looked at. All right. Um, so I guess we're back to reading the amended motion. Here. I've added the wording that was moved as an amendment. Direct staff were in order to report at the October 5th. Okay, so the action recommended the council permit staff to re-implement the collection of fares for downtown parking and transit when Victoria Hall is open to the public and further that staff ensure that a minimum of two weeks notice is provided to the public through all available media outlets and further that council direct staff to continue with the reduced service hours for transit at a savings of $5,400 per week and direct staff to bring forward a report at the October 5th, 2020 Committee of the Whole meeting. Thank you, Mr. Larmer. So there was a recorded vote, Chair, from um, Councillor. Yes. Okay. Bureau, so I will start the process for that. Okay. So uh, pursuant to our procedural bylaw number 009-2019, section 23, where a vote is required to be reported by law or request by a member immediately prior or subsequent to the taking of a vote, each member that is both present and qualified to vote shall announce his or her vote openly and any failure to vote by a member who is not disqualified shall be deemed to be a negative vote and the clerk shall record each vote in alphabetical order. When a member present requests a recorded vote, all members present at the councillor committee meeting must vote in alphabetical order unless otherwise provided by statute. The names of those who voted for and the names of those who voted against shall be noted in the minutes of that applicable meeting. The mayor, the presiding officer, and the chair in this case shall announce the results. Councillor Nicole Beatty. In favor. Councillor Aaron Burkat. For. Councillor Adam Bureau. No. Councillor Emily Chorley. Your mic was off, Councillor Chorley. Sorry, against. Councillor Brian Darling. Four. Mayor John Henderson. Four. Deputy Mayor Suzanne Sagan. Four. 
five to two. Chair, sure. motion carries. Okay, thank you. I think that just did I have another one, Mr. Larmer, or was it just a two. So, um, just to uh, note, we um, and maybe the 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 director of public works can note this, but. Um, we did receive correspondence from the MTO regarding the um, re the revoking of this um, transfer payment agreement just for some updates that need to be made in the contract, um, which they'll be sending out soon. Um, so uh, we request that this motion be withdrawn or this, this staff report recommendation and we brought forward by the Director of Public Works at a, at a later date um, once we receive more information and the updated um, transfer payment agreement from um, the MTO Ministry of Transportation. And I'll allow them. Um, the director, if they have any, if she has any extra information. Sure, I think you may you covered everything um, enough. I, I would receive this transfer payment agreement um, July 20th or so. So I wanted to get on the agenda right away. They usually have a quick turnaround to have council execute these agreements. But literally today, I received an email that said, please don't sign the agreement. We're changing it. And um, they didn't indicate what they were changing or when they would have the amended agreement, but I figured since you have probably already reviewed the agreement and, and um, it, it, I, I, you need to see the updated agreement to see what's changed before we vote on it. So. Okay, then I will uh, make the motion to withdraw from the agenda. And um, just for you, we did have some interest in delegation on this too, so that gives a chance for that individual to come forward as well and come back. Okay, so is there any comment on the withdrawal of the motion? Okay, I'll call the vote. All in favor? Opposed, if any? Carried. Uh, Mr. Larmer, back to you. And next, Your Worship, we have uh, Parks and Recreation Services, and we have Chair Councillor Emily Choi. <laughs> uh, thank you. Item one, memo from the Director of Public Works and the Director of Community Services regarding the assumption of Block 105, Plan 39M-876, Parkland of West Park Village, Coburg. The action recommended is that Council authorize the Municipal Clerk to prepare a bylaw to assume the parklands Block 105 of Registered Plan 39M-876. <laughs> Are there any questions or comments from members of Council? Mayor Henderson? Uh, through you, uh, Madam Chair, either to you or to the Director of Public Works. I know there was a fee associated with this with a third party. I'm just wondering, is this fee <laughs> continuous up to our budget time or how far into the year is this fee committed? I apologize, I didn't get to the question to you earlier. Director Wills, could you address that question, please? Sure, through the chair. I believe you were uh, referring to the $3,000 maintenance fee. Okay, so um, my understanding, and I don't want to speak uh, too far for uh, Director Huswick, I'll let him comment as well. Um, this is a very substantial park. Um, it has been on maintenance for the last two years. Um, and especially this year, considering we have a lack of students and resources in the parks department, um, taking on a park of this size in the middle of it was, uh, it would be beyond our resources. Um, so I believe that the quote for the $3,000 a month is from the um, existing contractor who's been maintaining the park for the last couple of years, just to continue doing this through to the end of the year until a more proper budget or resource allotment can be determined through the parks department. Thank you. Mayor Henderson, does that address your question? Absolutely, thank you. Great, are there any other questions or comments? Councillor Darling. Yes, thank you. I just wondered if this park has a name rather than just block five or whatever it is, if it has been named yet, or if that's yet to come. That's a great question. Um, Director Huswick? Uh, no, I don't believe uh, there's been a designated name for, for this park. I, um, references uh, through the development process, but I was just uh, speaking to the parks manager uh, earlier um, last week about uh, a number of parks that actually don't have names, and 
uh, so that's something that uh, we are going to have to deal with. Uh, so we'll probably put a report together in the near future about that. Um, if I may, Director Hosprick, when you put a name to him, I don't know whether we provide a municipal address as well with the park. So I, I mean, some some parks have the name, but when you try to refer to them where they are, you don't you don't refer to a municipal address. So sometimes, like you say, Jimmy Tracy Park, unless it says that it's on Spencer Street West, a lot of people don't even know where it is. So. May I ask that we put a, a an actual municipal address with each park if they don't have them? Sure thing. Thank you. Thank you, Great. Councillor Charlie. Um, Director McGlashan. Yeah, sorry. Um, if I may, um, um, Madam Chair, um, in response to uh, Councillor Darling, that uh, property actually already has an address. It's 847 McMurdo Drive. So um, certainly uh, any park name would be tied to that address. Thank you for the information. Are there any other questions or comments from council? Seeing none, I'll call the vote. All in favor? Opposed if any, and it's carried. So item two is memo from the director of community services regarding the status of Coburg Victoria Park Beach following the August 31st, 2020 Municipal Council resolution deadline. The action that I'm gonna put on the floor, just wondering if Mr. Larmer, could you put that up for us, please? The action that I'm gonna put on the floor is a combination of two of the staff suggestions. And this really is just to get the conversation started. I'm very interested in hearing what other members of council um, feel is the right course of action. So the motion is that council receive the report from the director of community services and further that council extend the closure of Victoria Park Beach until after the Labor Day weekend and further that the beach be reopened on weekdays only beginning on Tuesday, September 8, 2020 with the continued closure of the beach on Saturdays and Sundays until October 17th, 2020, when the fencing will be removed and the beach reopened. Are there any questions or comments from members of council? Mayor Henderson? Um, thank you. Uh, one point of uh, consideration uh, to your many details within your motion, it talked about October 17th and I've just checked my calendar, Thanksgiving ends on Monday the 12th. And I know at this point, uh, a particular community group is working with a read or a dedication to the Fern Blodgett Sunday celebration on October 17th. And we could have upwards close to a hundred participants. And, I, and of course that's to occur near the beach area in what I call the sensory gardens. So based on that, I'm wondering if there'd be any consideration to change the date to October 14th, which is a Wednesday. My rationale is it takes us past Thanksgiving weekend and still hopefully would provide enough time for uh, freeing everything up for the weekend, in particular, knowing that we have one of the significant events coming to the town of Coburg on October the 17th. Uh, starting at 1.30 in the afternoon. So a comment I'd like to put on the floor for your consideration. Okay, thank you, Mayor Henderson. Uh, do members of council have any response to the suggestion that the end date for the fencing would be October 14th? No, Mayor Henderson, would you like to put that amendment on the floor? Well, Councillor Charlie, I could, but if you're willing to agree agreeable to this and you can stay within the house of all your other important points, it, I think it really simplifies things if you're in agreement. Any objections from members of council? No? Yep, Councillor Bureau. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm in the mind thought of keeping the beach closed. We are still in the midst of this pandemic. Um, after the Labor Day weekend, I know generally kids go back to school. 
Uh, this year is kind of different. There's still a lot of people that are off of work. Uh, I, I don't know myself, it would just be a guess if uh, the beach would be either be, um, have more tourists coming or, uh, or not. My guess is if the weather is nice, they're gonna be coming. So uh, I, I, I'm in the mind frame of keeping it closed until October 1st. Okay, thank you for your comments. Are there any other comments from members of council? Councillor Beattie. Microphone, my apologies, Chair. Uh, I appreciate your motion. I am in support of uh, reopening the beach on, on weekdays, um, keeping the uh, it closed on weekends due to um, warm weather and a, a soft transition back to back to the community. Um, speaking with councillors in Selble Beach and Wasega Beach and Port Hope, um, uh, restricted access or closed period seems to be helping mitigate some uh, community anxiety and as well as influx population. I do have a question through you, Chair, and this possibly to either interim CAO or to the clerk. Uh, and it's really just around uh, enforcement bylaw staff, uh, do we feel comfortable, confident that we have um, the appropriate level of bylaw staff to cover this extension if the beach was to open on weekdays um, for visitors and safety precautions? Would we be enforcing maximum capacity on the beach um, to ensure physical distancing? Um, so really my question is just looking for some commentary around enforcement and uh, bylaw staff capacity. Thank you, Councillor Beatty. Uh, Mr. Davey, Mr. Larmer, would one of you like to field that question? Um, through you, Chair, I can start and maybe the interim CEO can follow if I missed anything. Um, regarding the tools that the enforcement, bylaw enforcement department has is, um, we have numbers, we have um, just hired a new bylaw enforcement officer as well, um, as well as we have, um, redeployment of the staff, which we hope to hold on to until after um, the busy season kind of ends. Um, um, the tools that our enforcement agencies have basically are bylaws, regulatory bylaws um, in place. Um, we don't have anything that would um, allow us to enforce any physical distancing. Um, I know there's a, a coming up, we have the physical distancing bylaw coming back to council for consideration as well. Um, again, which we prefer, so that's something. Um, we don't have any max capacities um, through bylaw in place at the Victoria Beach yet um, either. Um, so what we would be probably doing is enforcing the bylaws that already exist. So the nuisance bylaws, public nuisance bylaws, um, any parks bylaws, so um, every, um, park use bylaw, um, our barbecues, uh, those things like that. Um, um, I know um, Councilor Troy did ask me the question regarding the over capacity of the, the beach and, and I apologize to her, I didn't provide her with an answer right then and there because I had to think about that. Um, our bylaw enforcement officers this season has have um, an increased level of responsibility, um, a increased level of um, pressure um, from community and some other um, other individuals. So, so um, to put them in a place to um, have a, a them to have to shut down arbitrarily without an actual number or something in place like a bylaw um, could cause concern for them and you know how they do it and questions related to what you know. Um, the purpose of it and how they came to the conclusion of that. Um, so if, if um, the case would be, I think it's something we have to look at to give them extra tools. Um, if we're still worried about the physical distancing, um, some capacity on that or those those parts of it. Um, but with capacity right now, we're good because we don't have the numbers that we usually have. Um, speaking in past experience, um, after the Labor Day weekend is when we start to really see the decline um, in the use of our, our beach. Um, as well as when we get to the Thanksgiving week and our waterfront park can actually um, finish as well too. Um, we usually scale back on our officers, um, but again, this is not a normal year um, because the beach has been closed. Um, we don't know what to expect and we haven't known what to expect this whole process um, when it does open up. We should could have people that, um, like I said, that aren't working and you know there's some staggered school starts across the, the province. So um, we really, don't have the crystal ball in order to what to expect enforcement. I think this year um, for me as being the manager of it is 
um, we've had new relevations and experiences than we ever had. Um, what we do right now is we enforce that Trespass Property Act provincial. Once that beach is open, we no longer have that. Um, so then we have to resort back to our regulatory bylaws in those cases. So um, it's a complicated question. Um, so I hope that I provide a little bit of information for you, but um, it's nothing that we can't try and then come back to council or, or you know, make that decision at the senior level or something we can bring back or call a special meeting or those things forward if we do have those concerns. And I think the best way is to bring back um, through the directors and Dean, um, Director Hustrick and, and, and the interim CAO solutions um, if we do have a problem and something we can think about, you know, and we have been thinking about this whole process, anticipating if the beach were to open up. And I know the director has had many reports on that. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Mr. Lammer. That's very helpful. Uh, Mr. Davey, did you have anything to add? Uh, well, I just think that if the decision is made to open during the week, it would be during the weekdays, it would be made on the basis or the assumption that the crowds are not going to be significant. I think to open and then expect enforcement to enforce mm -hmm. physical distancing or enforce numbers on, on the beach, I think would be a a lot to ask. So I think the idea would be to open, hope that it works out well. If it doesn't, then steps would have to be taken to, to close it or something if, it, if that becomes an issue. But it would, I think it would be based on the key assumption that crowds are not going to happen during the week. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Davey. Are there any other questions or comments? Councillor Darling. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm a little torn here both ways. And sometimes I think just keeping it closed will alleviate a lot of headaches um, and concerns of some of the citizens. Um, we have opened up to stage three as Councillor Biro brought forward uh, in an earlier discussion. Uh, we've opened up our downtown, our pubs, uh, the main street, it's outdoors. Um, so I, I'm I'm kind of going with the fact that I don't think there will be the large crowds. And if we wait till after Labor Day and the 8th, monitor it through the week. And if it does turn out to be, uh, as we hope not, uh, huge crowds from out of town, then I, on the 14th, we have a committee to hold. I think then we close it till the till the 17th. And you know, we, a, lot of, a lot of people want to see it open We've seen other beaches open up parties, crazy things happening. I don't really think that will happen here. I'm hoping that the people will be respectful of each other and will lay their towels down if it is warm and keep some distance. A lot of people wear masks in the public, keep their physical distance. We're in the open air. A lot of the health um, uh, from the health units have said it's 15 minutes in close contact. Nothing's a proven fact yet, but I think with stage three and where we are, I think we can responsibly go with uh, opening it on the 8th and then monitor during that week. And, and then on the 14th, if we have to, we'll make an emergency uh, motion to close it again till the 17th. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Darling. Um, Deputy Mayor Suzanne Sagan, and then on to Councillor Bureau. Thanks, Councillor Chorley. Um, two things. Uh, your vision is to um, open the gate, um, I guess, at the beginning of Monday and leaving the gate open till um, the end of Friday. Is that how I'm envisioning it? You're not going to open and close it every night. You're going to leave it open for the week. Okay. And the second yeah. um, item, uh, we all have seen a tremendous amount of birds flocking near the shore. Um, is that at all a health issue um, for opening it up for possible swimming there? Do you anticipate there's any contamination of the water, of the beach? Um, just will a cleanup be required to, uh, to allow swimmers there after, you know, three, four months of being closed? Thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor. Those are great questions. Um, the intent with this was really to leave staff to determine exactly how the gates would be open and closed. My, my suggestion would be to harmonize uh, the opening and closing times with that of Port Hope. Port Hope as a municipality is also closing their beaches on the weekend until further notice. I believe they close on a Saturday morning 
and then reopen, I think at 10 a.m. on a Monday morning. Mm -hmm. um, but we could leave that to staff to determine. And I'm just wondering if Director Hustwick, could you just address the question regarding water quality and uh, um, bird droppings on Victoria Park Beach? Sure. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the, uh, the park staff continued to uh, rake the beach and uh, certainly if it was open, that would be a priority. Water quality testing uh, has been continued throughout the summer due to our blue flag designation. And we have not had any adverse uh, um, samples. So the water quality has, uh, has remained uh, good. Okay, thank you very much. Are there any other questions or comments? Mayor Henderson? Uh, thank you. Uh, I know we have proponents on both sides, but we do want to emphasize we are in phase three. Uh, staff has done, I, I feel, a brilliant job along the way to make good decisions along with council to ensure we're moving, uh, inching our way along. I know that Lucy is now opening up by appointment. I expect come September, we may see Victoria Hall open up to the public as we continue to move along the curve. I know that Director Husbick is sending a target date of August 31st with ministry and health discussions of how do we start to reopen up the CCC. And of course, we've already opened up our downtown through motion. So the province is opening up. I know we're doing it cautiously, but I do expect that staff through ourselves, through our comments from the community, if we feel we're not meeting uh, our standard. I have no doubt we'll call a special council meeting to deal with this critically important issue. I know we're all working hard to get it right. And I feel this is a step perhaps in allowing us to move forward based on actual stats within Northumberland or what we might call Peterborough South, which have main, remained for a consistent time, uh, very status quo, which I'm very pleased to report. So again, I appreciate the comments from everybody. And I appreciate your motion, Councillor Charlie. I feel it's another way for us to inch and move forward uh, with an overview from uh, the bylaw department, from the expertise from staff, and of course, what we'll hear from members of the community by way of council. So uh, again, if other than consideration at this point of the 15th, I think I noted, uh, I am support to, uh, uh, give this uh, an opportunity to flourish. Thank you, Mayor Henderson. And just to clarify, I wrote down your suggested date was October 14th. Is it the 14th or the 15th that you wanted to um, put sure, forward? I, I believe it's the Wednesday, which I believe is the 14th. Am I right? Sorry, I'll relook at my calendar. I apologize. Yes, the 14th. Thank you. I just thought Wednesday would take us away from Thanksgiving provide enough time for those days for staff and allow us to prepare for the 17th with a major function in the sensory gardens uh, for the town of Colbert. Okay, thank you. Any other comments from members of council? Uh, Councillor Burkhat and then Councillor Beatty. Thank you, Councillor Charlie. <clears throat> it would actually be my... Uh, opinion that we should open the uh, beach in full as that was kind of my intent uh, initially because I figured at this point we would have been through the phases and uh, the reopening of uh, obviously lots of things and I think it get, would give an opportunity for I know uh, there are a lot of children going back to school whether it's phased in or not uh, that aren't going to be able to experience this uh, beach and you know there's a lot going to be a lot of anxiety uh, amongst the children going back obviously um, e even if you're doing schooling from home or uh, from afar I know it's going to be difficult on all fronts it would ultimately be my preference to uh, take the fence down open the beach as of September 1st but uh, uh, obviously from what I'm hearing for other members of council you know, uh, a, a more phased in approach. But I, I think at this point, what we got to remember is we're not going to have the crowds. The, cr the crowds come from the events that we have, 
whether it's the Rib Fest, the Sandcastle Festival, those are where uh, the people kind of come to our beach. I don't think we're going to experience those kind of crowds. Even, even if we had the beach open, I don't think we were going to experience that. Because at the end of the day, uh, those, that's usually when the, the very, very busy times are. And uh, I think uh, as local health units uh, actually spoke to when uh, they were on a call that we really didn't have to put a whole lot of restrictions in place. Um, and I think there was just a lot of anxiety. And I think we've eased that um, by closing it initially. I, uh, my preference would be to open it fully at this point and uh, let's move past this um, and just give people the opportunity to use it for the last little bit that there is until the um, obviously the fall and uh, th th that's just my comment. Thank you for your comments. Councillor Beatty. Uh, thank you, Chair. I was just going to ask when the time comes uh, for a recorded vote. Certainly. Councillor Bureau. Thank you. Um, a couple things. If I heard um, our Mr. Larmer correct, uh, there is no way to um, patrol or uh, make sure that there is physical distancing on the beach because we are pretty sure that that's what he said. Second, we're in hopes that we don't have uh, tourism coming in after the long weekend. So we're hoping on that. Second, um, the pedestrian friendly weekends in downtown, the reason why that, that we opened them for the, what the DBIA's intent was, was so that everybody can go shopping downtown safe with physical distancing. So it's not an, it wasn't an event. It was a way to have everybody be physical distancing in downtown. So now what we're, it's my opinion, if we're gonna be opening up this Monday to Friday, it, one, it's gonna be going all over the news, just like when we closed it. Uh, to me, that's gonna trigger everybody to come back, especially um, whether it be on the weekends or the weekdays because there was a lot of people that came and didn't know the beach was closed even when they came off the 401 that that sign was still there at saying the beach was closed and they still came to me i would rather not risk it and keep us safe i'm proud of our citizens for what what they've done with uh keeping our cases low um we're talking back when kids go back to school or schooling from home. This is when the flu season's starting. And so what we're asking is, is saying it's okay to come on the weekends um, to, or on the weekdays to come down to our beach, but not on the weekends. So again, I can't, I, I'm, my vote's gonna be to keep it closed until October 1st. That'd be, that's mine. And that to me is making sure that uh, our residents are safe and uh, they've done a great job in um, keeping the cases low. So to me, I, I wanna help them out. I understand how people wanna go on that beach. I understand the sacrifices that they made and I thank them for that. But um, to me, for staffing wise, bylaw wise, um, policing wise, there's, to me, it, it keep it closed for this season and we'll look at it again next year. That's Thank my last comment. Thank you for your comments. Are there any other comments from members of council? Okay, before I call the vote, I'll just share um, some of my thoughts. I have been um, very mindful of the health advice we've received that the likelihood of the transmission of COVID-19 in open air environments, it's very, very low. Um, we had a delegation tonight, Adam White, he said there is no scientific data to suggest COVID-19 transmission and infection in open air environments. And I noted uh, that. Um, and I've been also tracking really where the hotspots are in Ontario. I have heard from citizens, they are concerned that visitors to our community might be coming from areas where COVID-19 is more prevalent. So the latest statistics that I've seen is that within our health unit, we have 2.2 uh, cases per 100,000. 
and uh, those are active diagnosed cases, so very, very low. Looking at Toronto Public Health, compared to our 2.2 cases, Toronto Public Health is reporting 7.6 cases per 100,000 um, po population. And then looking at Windsor, Essex, and here on Perth, they have much higher rates of COVID diagnosed at 18 and 22 cases per 100,000. Those are active cases. So at the moment, southwestern Ontario is more of the hotspot. Um, I think it's, it's difficult to anticipate exactly what the demand for our beach will be. There are so many factors that go into that, um, knowing that, yes, school will be starting, but there could be staggered starts. We've mentioned that. Also knowing that probably there will be more homeschoolers this year. Some people are still working from home. They haven't returned to the offices. Um, we have seen in other parks, Ontario parks and other municipalities, an increased demand for these kinds of public spaces. So it's very difficult to anticipate demand into September. It certainly will not be a normal September. But at the same time, I think it's important that if we can provide safe access to a public space, then um, we should do that. And taking a cautious approach, keeping it closed on the weekends when we are more likely to see larger crowds, I think is a sensible and phased approach. And with that, I think I will hand it over to Mr. Larmer for the recorded vote. Oh, Councillor Burkett, you had one further comment? Yeah, I'd actually like to put a motion on the floor. Sure. We actually recommended that council receive the report from the director of community services and further that council direct staff to reopen the Coburg beach beginning on Tuesday, September 1st, 2020, and that the fencing be removed. Okay. Any other comments or questions from members of council on the amendment? And Mr. Larmer, do we need to have a recorded vote for this amendment? or a general vote? A general vote? Yeah. Okay. No, okay, seeing no other comments, I'll call the vote on the amendment. All those in favor? Opposed? And it's defeated. So we'll go back to the original motion. And I'm just going to read it one more time for clarity because there was a date change there at the suggestion of Mayor Henderson that council receive the report from the director of community services and further that council extend the closure of Victoria Park Beach until after the Labor Day weekend and further that the beach be reopened on weekdays only beginning on Tuesday, September 8th, 2020 with the continued closure of the beach on Saturdays and Sundays until October 14th when the fencing will be removed and the beach reopened. Mr. Larmer. Yes. Um, so if it's okay with uh, me, Chair and Council, I'll forgo the procedural bylaw reading as I've done that already in the meeting. Is that okay? Yes. Um, so we're part of vote as requested by Councillor Nicole B. Um, first up, Councillor Nicole Beattie. Four. Councillor Aaron Burkett. Four. Councillor Adam Biro. Against. Councillor Emily Chorley? Four. Councillor Brian Darling? Four. Mayor John Henderson? Four. Mayor Suzanne Sagan? Four. So, Madam Chair, two, one. The motion is carried. Okay, so the motion is carried. Thank you, Mr. Larmer. And so, next on our agenda, We will be moving to item five on the agenda next. And this is memo from the Secretary of the Parks and Recreation Advisory Committee regarding a recommendation regarding the Coburg Beach. I'm gonna read a different, slightly different action recommended. And if Mr. Larmer can put that up for us, please.
So the action I'm going to put on the floor is that Council receive the recommendation from the Parks and Recreation Advisory Committee, or PRAC, for information purposes, and further that Council endorse the recommendation of the committee and request staff to investigate and report on how comparable beachfront communities are managing and regulating their beaches and waterfronts for public access with the report provided to PRAC by November 3rd, 2020, and further that council request PRAC to receive public input on how the town of Coburg can manage the popularity of Victoria Park Beach and provide recommendations to council by March the 1st, 2021. So I can speak to this very briefly. This, the intent of this motion is to address some of the concerns that we have had from members of the public. Um, as we've been discussing how to manage Victoria Park Beach in this age of COVID-19, we have heard from the public a lot of concerns, and we've heard them tonight as well, about how we manage so many visitors to our community um, and all of the, the impacts that that has on our community. And I think it is time for us to have that community-wide conversation. We heard from some delegates tonight suggesting a task force. I actually feel that the best forum for that discussion will be through our existing Parks and Recreation Advisory Committee. Um, the committee can receive delegations. Anyone who's interested in presenting to the committee can come and share their views. And hopefully the committee can be involved in um, undertaking some public engagement through Bang the Table. Are there any questions or comments on the motion? Mayor Henderson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate uh, your motion and your comments. Uh, the only question I have, and perhaps uh, for your uh, consideration, when I think of this, I also see there's a portion involving public works, especially if we're talking about parking in the area and what could happen. And I'm just wondering, how do you foresee uh, involving them into, into this discussion as well? Thank you, Mayor Henderson. That's a great question. I think, um, I think that deserves some thought. I think the Parks and Recreation Advisory Committee could certainly forward some questions to the Public Works Department and perhaps even receive a presentation from the Public Works Department when time allows. Um, there is a fairly long timeline here until March the 1st when PRAC would need to bring some recommendations to Council. So hopefully that would work with the schedule of our parks, uh, sorry, of our public works department. Um, I certainly think that parking is a very important part of this equation, and that has to be um, part of the consideration as we look at uh, how to manage the beach going forward. Are there any other questions, Councillor Beatty? Thank you, Councillor Charlie. I just actually like to thank you for, um, I think, a, a very strategic blend of citizen uh, concerns, uh, the expertise and the engagement at the parks and rec committee level. Um, we've talked about how, you know, this is a really great opportunity to leverage um, the functionality of, of our advisory committees, as well as um, continuing to embrace, um, you know, the expertise and the research and analysis um, that can come through uh, the community service department. So I will be supporting this. I think it's, I don't think we need to have a, a new tax force outside of the Parks and Rec Committee. And so I just um, applaud you for bringing this blended solution forward to for Council's consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Beatty. Um, Deputy Mayor Sagan. <clears throat> thank you, Councillor Charlie. Um, I also uh, want to thank you for bringing this forward. Um, I believe another layer, um, although a task force would bring new people, the, the, uh, this Parks and Recs Committee is already formed. They're already dedicated to um, the mandate that they have before them. And uh, I would like, uh, and I know you, you're a strong advocate of transparency and public engagement. So as the coordinator, I would like to see um, a real robust, possibly survey, but a real uh, robust engagement of our community. This has been an issue that none of us have ever um, dealt with before. So we have to get it right. I think we do need changes and I really look forward to uh, 
um, what your committee will come forward to and, and have another beach discussion down the road. But uh, it's, a, it's a good way of doing it and I, I applaud you and I will support it. Okay, thank you, Deputy Mayor. I'll certainly take that comment on board. Um, we haven't heard from Councillor Darling. Thank you, Councillor Chorley. Um, I too think this is a discussion that we need to have. Um, I'm just a little concerned about the workload. I'd like to confer with Director Hustwick that I think your November 3rd date um, with budget coming up around the corner and uh, the COVID staff limitations and what is, uh, is can I ask Director Huswick for his opinion on time frame and uh, the actual work it'll take to, you know, to get the data that's required. Absolutely. Director Huswick, can you comment on the time frames? Well, I would say ordinarily uh, November 1st wouldn't necessarily be a problem, um, but we are still at the moment, assessing the um, staffing requirements for reopening the CCC that we're about to talk about, that is likely going to consume a lot of uh, resources and reassignment of staff. Um, we can certainly do our best, um, but we're trying to avoid having to hire a lot of additional part-time people, although some of that may be required, but we are certainly reassigning roles and responsibilities in order to open the CCC. So that's my only concern is, uh, and we're still going through that process. Um, we can certainly shoot for November 1st. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Director Husvik. Based on your comments, we can push that date back to December 1st. That's when the following crack meeting is scheduled to take place, if that would help. Okay. Um, but the overall objective is really to have this conversation with the community for PRAC to bring rec recommendations to Council in the spring and make sure there's enough time to implement any changes that might need to be made ahead of the 2021 season. Are there any other comments? Mayor Henderson. Uh, thank you, Councillor Charlie, for your points. I just want to say thank you again because I was a proponent of banging the table because I saw the extensive use in the city of Kingston and how they use it in a myriad of the different fashions. And I know there was concern from the deputy mayor that perhaps we're not using it enough. And this is a, a great opportunity as you expressed uh, where we can use it and get back this uh, awesome uh, response from the public. So I want to thank you because we have the program and if we can put it out there as a multiple source, I'm hoping it will provide the, the stats, the feedback that we require through your committee to bring back uh, information to council. So again, thank you for um, recommending that. I think it's, uh, we have it, so let's use it. Absolutely, it's a great piece of software and I really like the way it allows us to share information with the public, but also to receive um, our residents feedback. Are there any other questions or comments? Seeing none, I'll call the vote. And just to, should I read it again or does everyone understand the, the small timeline change to December 1st for the report to come back to PRAC? Is that okay? Great, so I'll call the vote. All in favor? Opposed, if any, and it's carried. So that brings us to item number three on our agenda. Resolution from July 27th, 2020, Council Meeting, Town of Coburg 2015 Legal Opinion regarding the Town of Coburg Harbor. The action recommended is that council receive the legal opinions from 2015 and 2011 for information purposes. And just to let council and the public know, this is to fulfill um, a motion that council passed in July in response to a recommendation from the Parks and Recreation Advisory Committee asking that previous legal opinions on um, jurisdiction and the ability of the town to regulate on water activity uh, that those previous legal opinions be released to the public. Are there any questions or comments? Mayor Henderson. Um, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I'd just like to publicly thank um, 
staff and uh, Mr. Larmer and his department, corporate legislative services and working with legal. I get to see firsthand sometimes how overwhelming COVID has been on legislative services. And I'm pleased Steve, though this came forward in July that uh, Mr. Larmer and Mr. Davey stuck with this and staff and brought it back to us. Although it's uh, very timely, I feel being only August, but I, I really appreciate the fact that uh, he was very consistent in his approach. And uh, I admire that because again, I see firsthand how busy his department really is. So kudos and thank you to staff and Mr. Larmer for uh, bringing this forward because I know it was an important issue for the public. Okay, any other comments? Seeing none, I'll call the vote. All in favor? Opposed, if any, and it's carried. And that brings us to item four on the agenda, memo from the De Deputy Director of Community Services and the Recreation Coordinator regarding the Coburg Community Center reopening plans. The action recommended is that council receive the reopening of the Coburg Community Center on Monday, August 31st, 2020, report for information purposes. Are there any questions or comments? Councillor Beatty? Thank you, Chair. My apologies. If you can just give me one moment to open up my Word document with my questions. Okay. Right. Um, thank you. Uh, through you to most likely the Director Hustwick. Uh, just going back and forth with the NHMA, uh, the Hockey Association, uh, just a uh, I've been hearing some concerns that uh, only being open till 8.30 p.m. on weeknights could greatly reduce the available prime time ice rentals available for minor hockey players considering um, uh, work hours, school hours, et cetera. I'm assuming that this is due to limited staff resources and or capacity, um, but I, I just wanted to raise that as I had a few exchanges um, around that concern. Through, through you, Madam Chair, um, I just want to say, first of all, we've been working very, very closely with all of the different uh, recreational groups, uh, including minor hockey in the wild. Uh, we received their back to play uh, plans today. Um, Krista Williams, uh, one of our recreation coordinators, has been doing um, a great job um, working long days um, to understand and to work with all the different groups on their back to play programs. And um, so we, we, we've been following them, um, their efforts uh, over the last few weeks to work towards a startup. They, uh, their registration, minor hockey's registration just closed and they had 625 kids signed up. Um, last year they had 716, I think something like that. So they've had an overwhelming response from, uh, from families in the area. Um, so recognizing um, both the, that organization, the Wild and the Coburg Cougars, who we've been working also with very closely, we've put together um, a schedule that we believe is going to meet most of their needs. Um, until we get into ice allocation uh, discussions, um, we won't know for sure, um, but based on um, the number of uh, expected players, um, we put a schedule in place that we would actually open up the, uh, the second ice surface earlier than originally planned um, in order to meet that demand. So we're confident uh, that, that um, we'll be able to cover most of their, their requirements. And again, we will, once we get into the ice allocation discussions, um, we may need to do some tweaking but um, the schedule was designed around a reasonable staffing schedule. Um, beyond that makes it really challenging. Um, but again, it's going to be fluid and uh, we'll make adjustments as we need to. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other comments or questions? Okay, seeing none, I'll call the vote. All in favor? Opposed, Benny? 
and it's carried. And that's everything from Parks and Rec. You're muted, Your Worship. Armor? We don't have anything under protection services or culture and tourism services, which takes us back to you, Mr. Larmer, under unfinished business. Through you, Worship, members of council, there's one um, item, it's the diversity, equity, and inclusion policy on August 24th um, that you will see here. Um, what um, the report is, it is in development um, currently. Um, we do have um, a member of staff starting here soon, and um, it's our accessibility coordinator, Dean Kramer, and um, I'm looking to seek some um, assistance from that new position um, as well, because she comes from the Center of Diversity and Inclusion, um, the Canadian Center for Diversity and Inclusion, and she's worked with a number of municipalities on this, as well as um, one of the first founding municipalities of the city of Windsor um, she was with. Um, where she started this program and she's worked directly with um, Ms. Pelley's public sector on this. So um, um, the report is ongoing. Um, this will be a report among many reports, um, a program and policy. Um, um, this report is getting developed as we speak and, and, and we should be able to bring it back um, sooner, um, uh, as soon as, as we can. I'm thinking more or less to um, the October meeting and maybe the end of October for that. Okay, thank you. Are there any questions from members of council? Uh, Councilor Burrell? Yeah, um, are we able to add the MOUs from the library and the art gallery onto the unfinished business? It is business and it's not finished. Mr. Larmer? Yes, yeah, so um, I can make the, um, the commitment that I will go back into the minutes and finals resolutions. Um, and put them on the unfinished business um, because I know the public library one was on that. Our galley came from a budget meeting um, a couple of years ago. So um, I will look at that. I will add what I can um, and we can go from there if that's suitable to the member. Seth, so Vice Councilor Burrell. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Any other comment? Seeing none, I believe that takes us to the committee of the whole form. So you just let me. Um, check my email, apologize. Um, through you, Your Worship, there has been no submissions to the um, committee of the forum for tonight's meeting. Okay, thank you. Um, and if council, um, we're now into closed session. Uh, does any council feel they need another three or five minute Break before we go on to closed session. So your worship, we need the we need the motion to be moved by the deputy okay, mayor. Thank to you. Session and then we'll okay. Time. Go to deputy mayor. Thank you. Thanks, your worship. Um, closed session item action recommended that council meet in closed session in accordance with section two thirty nine two of the municipal act S O two thousand and one regarding S two thirty nine two B personnel matter matters about an identifiable individual, including municipal or local board employees. One personnel matters, chief administrative officer, CAO recruitment. Thank you. Now, just a question of clarification to members: Shall they need another five minute break? I assume we could so be we in close. Just need to vote on it. Your worship. Yeah, we need to vote okay. on it, your worship. All those in favor? Against? Carried. So five minutes, thank you. And Mr. Larmer, you'll set that up as we come back? Correct. Thank you.